Ahoy, mateys. This is KAB Antonio Bay. Stevie Wayne here, beaming a signal across the sea to the men in the seagrass, 15 miles out tonight. A warm hello. And keep a watch out for that fog bank heading in from the east. In the meantime, relax with me while I play this song from the Coupe de Ville's, dedicated just to you. Hello, I'm Amanda. And I'm Christopher. This is Matt. I'm Allison. And this is What Scares Us, a podcast brought to you by the Ann Arbor District Library, where four friends dive deep into the dark, murky waters of the horror genre. This marks our first episode featuring an 80s movie. Today we are discussing the 1980 film, The Fog, directed by John Carpenter. It stars Adrian Barbeau and features a horror staple actor, And yes, the Scream Queen herself, Jamie Lee Curtis, is in it. And her mother, Janet Lee, of Psycho fame, is in it. But I'm talking about my favorite, Tom Atkins. (laughs) We'll talk more about him later. Um, I could do a whole separate podcast about him. Um, So, what the heck is the fog all about? Well, it's about fog. But the general synopsis is that 100 years ago... The elders of the coastal fishing village Antonio Bay sent out a false light signal on a foggy night, sealing the fate of the sailing vessel Elizabeth Dane and the merry band of lepers she carried. As Antonio Bay celebrated its centennial, the long-dead Captain Blake and his crew from the Elizabeth Dane merge from an otherworldly fog to claim their vengeance by taking six lives. I'm a big fan of this movie. That's why I wanted to pick it to talk about it today. This movie is directed by John Carpenter. And the producer was Deborah Hill. They both co-wrote it. And they were actually together and had broken up after the making of the first Halloween together. And then he later dated Adrian Barbeau. And then The Fog was the first film that Adrian and John worked on together while they were dating. Um, The Fog was Jamie Lee Curtis's first film after starring in John Carpenter's Halloween. So there's a character named Nick Castle, which is the name of the actor who plays Michael Myers in Halloween. It is a John Carpenter day today, so get ready. (laughs) Um, John Carpenter, speaking of him, uh, he has a cameo at the beginning of the film, which is always fun when he appears. And this was Tom Atkins' first time in a Carpenter film. He was then also in Escape from New York and then Halloween 3, Season of the Witch, my favorite of the Halloween movies. What? (laughs) Yep. Sorry, friends. Well, that in the 1978 one. Um, Also, The Fog, sadly, was not well received at first, Um, but it has now grown into a classic loved by many. I feel like a lot of these, especially some of these 80s ones, were like, oh, was not well received, but then people fell in love with it. Um, I have did. I don't know about y'all, and I'm very excited. Another reason I wanted to talk about this today was because I know two people hadn't seen it, and two of us have, which is always a good mix when you're getting ready to talk about a movie. Um, so I love this movie. It is on my yearly list. I watch it every year, especially during spooky season. It's a simple ghost story. It's a revenge story. It has wonderful 80s fashion, amazing music strewn throughout it. Um, It's cheesy, it's campy, it's dark and mysterious, it's weird, it's like so much what is going on. Uh, And I would love to watch this on a grainy VHS tape on a VCR in the dark. Christopher, tell us your relationship with The Fog. (laughs) Well, I may or may not have seen it before. I actually don't remember. If I had seen it, it was a long time back. And when I told my daughter how long it may have been, she said, I haven't even been around that long. (laughs) So um, it was so much fun to be back in the 80s watching this movie. It really feels like it's on the cusp of the 70s and something that came after it. Um, Plus, I was surprised at the gore. I mean, you don't see much blood at all. But it's got some gory bits to it, in addition to just kind of this more lighthearted feel at times. And I, I love the beginning, and I, I know we're going to get into this, but I love the kind of almost story within a story mm-hmm. that the beginning of the movie uh, starts with. So it was a lot of fun. Really liked it. Uh, my relationship with this movie is I saw it pretty young. The first time I saw it, it was because I knew it was a John Carpenter movie and I loved the original Halloween and I also really liked the second one, even though he's mostly just a producer on that. I was kind of bored by it the very first time I saw it, but I've grown to love it and I honestly think that it might 
this is weird, but it might be my favorite John Carpenter movie because Whoa. it perfect. I know that doesn't make a lot of sense because <laughs> anybody else would say The Thing or Halloween, but my top three and it mm-hmm. kind of rotates are those. But like you, Amanda, I watch The Fog every year, no matter what. It's on my like okay, it's it's October. We're gonna try to watch a scary movie every day for October, no matter what. The Fog is in there. Mm-hmm. Um, it's my favorite John Carpenter score. I, there's just there's so much going for it and it's it's a little bit different for him and it's also like it's a step up sort of in budget from Halloween and you can tell yeah I love this movie and this time when I watched it, it was the first time I watched it with the director commentary and I gleaned a lot of interesting stuff that I didn't know about it I didn't know how hard it was to make I didn't know that almost half of it was reshot mm-hmm, I didn't yeah. know that it was they kept saying that it was like this movie came together in the edit and pretty much everybody that worked on it doesn't think it's great. And I think they're all crazy because I <laughs> love it. That's so. what's that's what's amazing about it. Is this one of those movies where it's like, ah, eh, that's a piece of garbage. And then it's like, whoa, we love it. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, yeah, I love it. I love it. I had never seen this movie before. Um, I also realized that I haven't really seen very many John Carpenter movies. I watched The Thing last October for Halloween and loved it. Um, I think that's like his most famous and most beloved movie for a reason. It's his favorite too. Is it? Yeah. Really? Huh. Yeah. I was interested to see more of his uh, repertoire. I really don't know that much about John Carpenter. Um, I've seen him in like uh, History of Horror or like little compilations like that or interviews with horror directors, but I knew basically nothing. I knew nothing about I didn't know this movie existed before we did this. So it was interesting to me. Yeah, I just saw The Thing for the first time probably last year or the year before. Wow. I'd never seen The Thing before. I'm not a huge, like, I get John Carpenter. I appreciate his work and what he's done for the genre and other filmmakers and people who are super fans of him. Mm-hmm. And the music is phenomenal. Yeah, yeah it's really um, And I understand, like, his mark on everything, but I'm not, like, I'm not a fan girl about it. Um, I do like a bunch of these campy horror, like Escape from New York. Like, all there's just some really good stuff. Because, um, again, I like the cheesy, campy, like, 80s stuff. Like, low-budget, like, mediocre, like slash fabulous acting and some like terrible cuts and some great weird sound effects. I just, I'm, yeah, I'm, I, I'm here for that. So at this point, we are going to move into the film. We'll talk about it at length, lots of details that are important and not so important and things we really need to say or want to say. Um, so if you haven't seen The Fog, just stop right now and go watch The Fog and then listen to this later. Uh, so, The Fog is about a bunch of fog, and terrible <laughs> things happen when the fog comes. Um, so, we got the premise, and basically, I mean, there's not a lot of setting. So, basically, we have a town with history. We've got a boat lost at sea. The town's anniversary celebration is happening. A journal from 1880s found in a church. There's a radio DJ on the air from a lighthouse for most of the film. And there's a band of ghosts seeking revenge on one night of the year. So, um... The film starts with an Edgar Allan Poe quote on screen. All that we see or seem, but a dream within a dream. Which was picked by Deborah Hill. Yes. So, um, also that reminds me of David Lynch. Um, so, the, the quote itself, or just it's starting with a quote? No, the quote itself. Uh, Edgar Allan Poe quote, and then it cuts right to the campfire story on the beach. Um, then after the campfire, we get to the credits of the title and right. the, the theme and everything. Um, so there's a campfire on the beach. It's 1150, almost midnight, time for one more story. And there's a, a gentleman on a beach with a bunch of children. Scaring the shit out of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All of the kids look scared. I was, you know, it's perfect. I love that setup. It makes me laugh looking at it, though, because it's just like, who the hell is this old guy? And how did he get all of these kids here? Yeah. Are yeah, they just, Boy Scouts? I know, right? But he also has had, he has his little hat on, so it's just assumed like, oh, he's, he has something to do with boats. How did he get all these kids here? <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's a good way to start, because basically it's just a cold open on this beach, and he's, so he basically tells the story of the... um the fishermen who were who died and now that there's revenge he's kind of setting you up for this ghost story so it is a story within a story because he tells you the ghost story and then the ghost story basically comes true because it is the hundredth year so he's kind of giving a warning about hey yeah it's a good setup yeah all right so we've got our campfire the credits roll the fog john carpenter's the fog and then 
There's a close-up of a radio. And I love that throughout this whole movie, there are all these close-ups of the radio. And we have Adrienne Barbeau as Stevie Wayne with her wonderful voice just narrating little pieces as we zoom in on different parts of town, like throughout the entire film, which I thought was really great. So before we ever see Stevie Wayne in her lighthouse as her radio DJ, we just see see a close-up of the radio and we hear her voice just kind of setting the scene. Um, And then the first major scene is in the church. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Where we where we're immediately greeted with a young, fresh faced John Carpenter in his only on you know only speaking role ever, um, other than I think body bags. But that was he was supposed to be dead in that. You, like you were saying about the radio, I love that you're repeatedly shown the radio that's playing this radio program. It becomes its own little character in the movie. The radio shots were amazing. I'm glad somebody else appreciated those and the music as well. So in the church, um, we have John Carpenter, and he's talking to a person. He's talking to Father Malone, um, who is drinking, and there a rock falls from somewhere, and then inside the wall he finds a diary from 1880, which is of his... Was it his his grandfather? is also Father Patrick Malone, and... It's just recounting, like, the the history of the men in the sea and, like, how terrible things got. It's the great Hal Holbrook. Yeah, isn't that his last movie role, I think? That might be. And it's also, you'll notice that he never leaves that room because it was, they could only afford to have him on one set piece. So that's why he's in the church for the entire movie. Yeah. (laughs) So. And there are several, so honestly, when I watch this, I kind of loathe all of the church scenes. I don't know why. I just find them like boring and like, I have to like, kind of like, and then wait a minute. (laughs) And then I'm like, okay, now we're back to the good stuff. Uh Like, I don't know why. And you need those points in the film. Like, it's just. No, I. I get that, though. It takes me somewhere else. But yeah. th- I didn't know that about Hal Holbrook only being in one setting, because he is only there. Yep. And I mean, he's got to be in his office and drink and wait for, like, you know, town to, like, go to hell. Uncovering all the secrets before yeah. he, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and not paying the cantor. That was whatever. so funny. <laughs> so, Father, can I get paid? How about you come in late tomorrow? How about you come at bud? six tomorrow? And yeah. he makes the perfect little face as a reaction to that. <laughs> yeah. It's so yeah. weird. Like, why do we need that? Yeah. Like, John Carpenter's like, I want to be in my movie, and here's what I'm going to say. Right, right. He's just like, well, I have to establish that you're a piece of shit. So, so why don't you do it this way? <laughs> yeah, those Malones destroying things. Um, so I we think I read... So John Carpenter's character's name in that is Bennett. Yeah. And yep. it's short for Bennett Tramer, which is John Carpenter's real life friend that he met at USC. Aww. But in Halloween, the boy that Lori likes is Ben Tramer. Yep. Yeah. So that's another little connection. I know I mentioned that Nick Castle is a character name and that was also an actor. Yeah. There's a few other ones. And then there's a list and I didn't write them down, but there's a few other character names that are crossover with actors and producers and people that were in the film. So that's yeah. another one. Dan yeah. O'Bannon is yeah. another yeah. one. Yeah. yeah. And, I was so psyched. Yeah. Yeah. I like it when little things like that happen. For people who've seen other things, it's like, oh, Easter eggs for me. Thank you. <laughs> well, what's, what's cool is so much of the production staff, the writing staff carried over from Halloween because it was mm-hmm. only a couple of years later and they were still this tight knit unit. Mm-hmm. So it's like the same director of photography. So it kind of has a similar look, has uh-huh. similar lighting, has similar sound design. Mm-hmm. Like the, it feels very much like a continuation of Halloween, almost more so than Halloween 2 does. Um yeah, and so you get a lot of those little winks and nods, which is another thing I love about John Carpenter because he's very loyal to the people that he works with. I have to interject here that we've got a, a reference to a prior episode as well because Dark Star, uh-huh. yes, John Carpenter's, I think it was his first movie. It was a student yeah. film. Right. Yeah. Was a huge inspiration for Alien. Oh. Yep. yep. So. Yeah, those guys went on to make Alien and yeah, Dan O'Bannon, uh-huh. it's Dan O'Bannon, John Carpenter, and I don't remember who the other guy is now, but yeah, yeah, very That's cool. That's so cool. Yeah. I was really glad we did the Alien episode first because otherwise that would have just like flown right over my head. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. All right, so we've got the diary found. Um, so the beginning, we still don't know what's going on or where we are, but there's some amazing establishing shots at the very beginning once we get into it, like the town is quiet and dark 
and it's right after midnight, and then things start to happening. I love all of these scenes that were probably shot later to make it look scarier. Um, But we've got, yeah, the payphones start ringing. Everything is very ominous. There's a young man sweeping inside of a grocery store nearby, and things start falling off the shelves and rattling. Takes a sip of that orange juice and puts it back. So fucking gross. Who does like, why? that? He's Probably just a lot a of people. Teenage kid. Yeah. 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 Um, Who puts it back on the shelf though to sell? Like, that just guy. take it. He doesn't care. <laughs> He's not there for the love of the job or the lack of money. <laughs> he's, was, he's probably not getting paid very much. No, poor kid. <laughs> yeah. Um, so he's just sleeping away. And then I also like that they cut to a scene where there's a woman in a house and a chair moves. So you can see that it's all across town. Things are starting to get weird. And then, of course, Stevie is doing her voiceover from a radio. And then there's a truck rattling down the road. <laughs> I really liked all of the, like, stuff shaking and the car alarms going off and, like, the hydraulic thing lifting the car up. Mm -hmm. Although, um, I think I'm the only person in the world who has this opinion. Everyone seems to, like, absolutely love the opening scene. I almost wish it wasn't there because I had a lot of trouble at the beginning trying to figure out, like, okay, why are the pirates affecting the car alarm? You know what I mean? Like, how is this connected and I think it would have been a little spookier not knowing the backstory and just seeing all this stuff happen around town. Mm. Mm-hmm. But everybody else on the internet absolutely loves the first scene, which I think was one of the reshoots. It was. Yeah, it yeah. was added on afterwards. Well, I like the yep. beginning because you hear that ghost story and you're like, ah, this old dude on the beach with these kids, <laughs> he's an old fisherman living out the story dream because right. you don't know if it could be real or not. And then when the payphones start ringing and things are looking like weird and ominous and dark, and you're like, wait a minute. Is that because of that? Like, you're not quite sure what's, like, yeah. as a, I guess as a first time viewer, you're not quite sure, like, which direction it could go. I also just like that because it's really, just really beautifully well done. These sparse little, like, tropey 80s-ish, 70s-ish, like, little, like, scenes just kind of setting the scene. Yeah. So, I think if they didn't do it at the beginning, it would have been, it, it could totally, you could have moved that to, like, the middle of the movie, too, mm-hmm. to yeah. show that things were still happening that were weird. It just kind of sets the scene for knowing that weird things are happening across town. That's what I think it did for me and for the movie. Right. And I and uh, in the director's commentary with Deborah Hill, John Carpenter was talking about that essentially they treated it as the three acts are the first is weird things are happening the night before the the death of the of the the leper colony people, <laughs> and then you have the night of, and then you have the you know essentially mm-hmm. so like they kind of they felt like they had to put that in there, and then it, the movie didn't make sense. If they didn't have that ghost story, at least that was the way that they thought about it. Yeah. If you didn't have so. that scene and you just had Stevie talking on the radio, none of that existed. And then you have um, Tom Atkins and Jamie Lee in the pickup truck and then like the window gets blown out. And then there's like, you start seeing ghosts and things and you don't have any, like why is, your brain needs a minute to process that, okay, weird things are happening mm-hmm. before you jump to like seeing like shapes. Right. I don't know. I think so. Um, so yeah, so we have um, we meet our first um, characters. We've got Nick Castle, played by the Tom Atkins. I love him. He's so amazing, and oh, um, he's in like the weirdest movies, and he's just, he's like the same person every time. But he's so good, and he plays a great police officer. But he's not a cop here. He's just Nick Castle, truck driver, and or he's a fisherman. But he's driving this truck, and he picks up a hitchhiker. And it's Jamie Lee Curtis, and she hops in, and one of my favorite—it's one of my favorite little scenes because she just hops in, and he's just, you know, they're casual beer drinking just in the front cab driving. of this thing, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right. and then she says that she's never hitchhiked before, and then she looks at him and she goes, "Are you weird?" I love, and I'm that. like, "Oh God, is she gonna get kidnapped and murdered?" Uh-huh. And then. He says, yes, he's weird. And she's like, oh, thank God. I thought you were going to be normal. The last guy was so normal. It was terrible. Um, I just love that little little scene setting it up. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's yeah. a great line. She has so much charisma. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yes. Yeah. It's just really good to see those two together. Um, and then after we see that, we finally get to see Stevie Wayne in person in the lighthouse. So she is a radio station DJ, and it's just her show. And she shoots from a, life ho- a lighthouse on Spivey Point. And we see her for the first time, and then um, Dan O'Bannon, our buddy, the weatherman, calls her for a fog report, um, and there's a missing boat. We've got a missing boat. Let's see. The seagrass is M-I-A. Are um, they dating Dan and um, uh, 
the DJ lady? I like, don't think so. Okay. It's it's like it definitely they set it up that like the, every man in town is essentially like, oh yeah, yes. I want to meet, I want to meet her. <laughs> yeah, you know, which we even get when they get to the boat scene on yeah. the boat. Yeah, uh, she's a hot mom. <laughs> she's a, she's a hot mom, and she lives in a cool house, yeah. and and uh, and most people have only heard her voice; they haven't seen her, except for then that guy in the boat says, "I've seen her." <laughs> <laughs> it's just like this 1980 casual like, hey lady. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> it's just it, yeah, and it she's was, like back up. Yep. Like I like the voices on the radio only. Yep. <laughs> which so, is which is an awesome yeah. way to diffuse that. But also, I feel like I just got the impression that since he's the weatherman and she's on the news, or she's doing the radio show and she's giving like reports on weather, like they just have this. I think they just chat over the phone and do this casual flirtation thing because mm-hmm. she needs to get information about the weather from him mm-hmm. when she's like talking about like an east and west and directional things. That was mine. Like, yep. I, yeah. Um, I, I I agree. I'm I'm with you. Um, so we have, Dan says there's a missing boat, and then we cut to a bunch of men drinking beers, um, pounding some bud on the seagrass, and then we finally see the fog. Well, this is after they go, there's no fog bank yeah. out there. And then, and then one of the funniest lines in the movie is, hey, there's a fog bank out yeah. there. <laughs> My note says the fog bank rolls in. So yeah. it is the movie's now called The Fog Bank, by the way. Right. Yeah. yeah. John Carpenter got that part wrong. <laughs> I love the way that that shot looks when he's looking out there because the guys are all lit really specifically. Um, I, most of this movie has really interesting lighting, and uh, courtesy of Dean Cundy, who went on to shoot um, a little movie, Jurassic Park. And, oh, wow. and a whole bunch of other stuff with John Carpenter, but a really great career. Um, for <clears throat> normally, I, I know that shooting movies back in that time, shooting something really dark would make it look really bad. Mm-hmm. So they would do that thing where they would shoot during the day, but then color correct it, almost oh. like what they did in Jaws and Deliverance and stuff like that. But they didn't do that in this, and it's great because then they're able to hide a lot of stuff in the dark, which they do a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I like the way that they make the fog look on the water because the fog actually yeah. glows. And so I like the way they make the fog look because you actually believe it looks like that. Yeah. Uh, so this is the first time we're seeing the fog. And then I also really like that once we start seeing the ghosts, they're just shadows. Shadows with like these giant like fish hooks as their weapon. So it's just it's still very like mysterious mm-hmm. of who these people are. These are like the ghosts, the beings, the zombies, the the men from the dead that are yeah. here searching for those six people to murder. And they've got their first few victims on this boat. Yeah. I really liked how the fog looked. Yeah. Um, and then the way that the ship moves into frame and then mm-hmm. like disappears. That was one of my favorite shots in the whole movie. It's mm-hmm. the coolest shot. It's almost a shame that they didn't do anything more with the pirate ship, but it's perfect that you just see it that one time because mm-hmm. yeah. the, sc- the sense of scale of it is like, oh shit, that thing's huge and this is extra scary. Yeah. My notes are like, ooh, a spooky fog, <laughs> a mysterious disappearing <laughs> ship. Yeah. <laughs> and the fact that you can't really make out anything about the guys with the hooks makes them mm-hmm. extra scary. It's mm-hmm. the same kind of thing as Alien, where the less you see them, the scarier they're going to be. Uh-huh. Um, one, of my, one of my notes that I had here was, head stab, ouch. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Is it through his eye? It's like, it looks like it's through his eye, and it's too, like, pokes. It's yeah. it's rough. That's the guy that's still on the boat. Yeah. Who, um, I think... If I'm not mistaken, I think the, the the pirate ghost that comes in at that point is played by Tommy Wallace, who was the guy that edited this movie. Oh. Actually, pretty much any time you see like ghostly hands bashing through something, that's Tommy Wallace, who oh. also was one of the Michael Myers characters mm. in Halloween. Oh, so. is he the one with the hand through all of the church windows yep, later? It's him. always the same guy. It's almost always him. Yeah, that's cool. Yep. That's so neat. Yeah. I liked that imagery too. Not that we're there yet. Yeah, yeah. We'll get there, though. <laughs> I recently watched something else that was set on a boat, and it has, oh, gosh, what was it? It was something, and that thing was the murder, a big another fish hook was the murder weapon. Oh, I'm not going to remember what movie that was. So it made me, that's what it made me think of, mm-hmm. was, that it was, and I don't know anything about fishing or what that thing was, and that's a, if that's a big hook, you're catching a big fish. Like, what are you catching? Like, a, a great white, a nar- <laughs> yeah, seriously. Um, <laughs> See, I just think of hay hooks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's like this what giant hook. Oh, yeah. Like a. F- aren't those like a pincher? You use them to yeah. grab bales of hay. Yeah. But that's clearly not what the lepers were using. Uh. Right. <laughs> right. 
Which at this point, do we even know that they're lepers yet? I don't no. think that no. Hal Holbrook has read that that line in That's his right. in the spooky journal that fell out of the ceiling. Right. Oh, so the movie. I, okay, I recently watched this for the first time. I know what you did last summer, the first one. <gasps> oh. I've never seen it before, and I recently watched it, and that had the boat scenes yes. where there was a giant fish hook. That's but, right. So that's what. Yeah, and yeah. I this was the first time I'd seen The Fog after watching I Know What We Did Last Summer. I'm watching all of these in weird orders. Um, <laughs> I love that we are all kind of doing that. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we've got our first uh, death scene. We've got our first, uh, we're trying to kill six people. We've killed a few people there. The fog rolls out. It's still not even 1 a.m. Stevie Wayne's in the studio. Nothing but water, Stevie. She's talking to Dan. And then we see another radio with some lovely voice, some lovely music. And there's two people in bed <laughs> flipping through an art book. <laughs> Um, it's Tom Atkins and Jamie Lee Curtis, and they don't know each other's names yet. <laughs> that was really um, funny, too. That's right. There were yeah. a couple of really great lines in this. <laughs> I love that. That's, like, one of the only things we know about Jamie Lee Curtis's character is, like, she hitchhikes, she's rich, she draws, and she's willing to fuck this guy that could be your dad. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, yep. But, too, like, I also, also, the scene is very tasteful. It's very short. They're just, like, lying in bed. Like, they're both covered. Um, they're just flipping through a book, and it, he, is he smoking or not? They're just in bed chatting, um... And then there's a banging on, like, there's, it's really, really a short scene, but you're just like, oh, you also learned her name is Elizabeth, yes. yeah. which I don't remember from before, but yeah. this is the first time I thought about it. I'm like, why is she named Elizabeth when the boat is called Elizabeth yes. Dane? Yeah. Like, that that's really just, that doesn't make me. any sense to me why that would be important. Like, unless she wanted, like, why is she, her, her name Elizabeth? Well, she does say that she feels like bad luck follows her yeah. around. Yeah. So that's kind of a, just a cool T- not a tie-in, but just a cool reference. Okay. Yeah. I don't. I mean, she's not really responsible, right. probably. No. But yeah. it's, it's kind of neat that she's the harbinger of... Because she does say that everything started going bad as soon as she got into town. Yeah. yeah. And he's her 13th hitchhiker, yeah. dude. Well, and it's almost like they're trying to they're trying to set that up so that the audience is trying to be like, oh, it's, this is her fault. Yeah. You know? And then it turns out that, makes that sense. it's totally yeah. not. Like she you know? is the Elizabeth Dane, perhaps. Yeah. yeah I thought maybe the Elizabeth Dane doesn't exist and it's her. She's a boat. She is. Yeah. <laughs> she's a, she's she's a, a boat. boat. <laughs> she's a boat and like 12 lepers. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. I did think that like it would come into the mythology somewhat. Like, oh, she's a descendant of the original Elizabeth or like yeah. she, that's why she was called back to the town. Like that's why she like is hi- hitchhiking. But yeah, just separate. I mean, Elizabeth's a pretty popular name. I guess it shouldn't be that. Like in 1980? But. Her name should have been like Kathy or something. <laughs> <laughs> Karen. Um, the yeah. Kathy Dane. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, but then they're in bed and they're just hanging out looking at this art book. And then there is a, a banging on the door. It's the ghosts. I also freaking love that these ghosts just knock on the door whenever they arrive at someone's <laughs> yeah. house to murder them. They're polite. <laughs> really polite. Yeah. 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 They know it's after dark, and they uh, right, well, it's best to cut off. <laughs> I'll knock with my hook so they can definitely hear me. <laughs> I love that uh, this Nick Castle guy has like a uh, shoji style transparent like windows in his house. Yeah. Like, why is that in this like little like very small cozy like California coastal town? <laughs> Living in like a dojo or something? Yeah. What is this? <laughs> but so, it's a really cool shot. I thought it was really pretty. It's awesome. And yeah. like the silhouette of the ghost and just like it. Oh, that's one of the many things that reminded me of Halloween is like this uh, like unknown, unknowable force that is like silently mm-hmm. stalking the town. Mm-hmm. Yep. Cool. Yeah, and I just love that it's a shadow. And every time, like, the ghosts are appearing, it starts where it's darkness. There's a banging on the door or whatever. And then they go to get the door, and you don't know where they are. They're going to come in the house. You just see, the, again, you're just seeing these shadows and glimpses of these ghosts that are out to murder, which I just think is really, it's a really simple technique, but it's just so, it's so good and so fun in this movie. Yeah. And also, every time the ghosts are about to appear, the fog appears. So you see the fog rolling in. There's a banging, there's a fog, and sometimes the fog comes in the door, it blocks the windows, then when you, as you're looking out to see who was banging on your window, you can't see because the fog is there. Yeah. And it's like this thick, white, like, fog smoke. It's right, right, right. <laughs> yeah. right. But it's it's so simple, but so effective. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the way it's lit up and glowing, I, I thought it was really a cool effect. And even later on, when we see the fog covering the town, mm-hmm. I mean, I was thinking about it, and I wasn't sure... How they filmed that or whether it was... It's practical. Yeah. And they had to reverse it because it was so windy, they would fill the street with fog, but then it'd be going away. So anytime you see a car driving through, that car is reversing through the shots. That's a lot of fog. It's a lot of fog. 
Full fog, fog juice. Yeah. Fog, juice. fog juice. Yeah. Yeah. It smells like pancakes. The secret ingredient? <clears throat> fog juice. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it was fog, and then or they used the fog juice, but then they also used like dry ice too. Mm-hmm. Huh. Yep. I also love that um, as soon as it turns one o'clock, the ghost is like, "Oh, it's like much too late for a visit." <laughs> ah, shit, we I'll gotta go to bed tomorrow. now. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> just disappears. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So Stevie steins off the radio, um, and then Stevie's at her house, and yeah. she has a son. And guess who her son is? He's the young boy that was on the beach being told the ghost story at the beginning. I thought that was really fun. I love that kid actor. He's super mm-hmm. cute. Like she's like, "Yeah, you're a real fucking annoying kid." He's like, "Yeah, I know, mom." Sure, mom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sure, mom. Look at this piece of driftwood I found. <laughs> I did wonder why he wasn't like, "Yeah, this old guy just told me this story about all these uh, killer ghosts." <laughs> Right. right. Well, they 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 really quickly in like a little bit of exposition. She says, "Like, d- did you thank whatever that guy's name Mr. was, Macon? Yeah. Yes. For yeah. And then did you thank so and such for driving you home? And um, yeah. And scaring the shit out of you. And scaring the shit out of you <laughs> and all of your friends. Um, yeah. Well, but, plus two, I think they had to set it up where is if she's a nighttime radio host and she's got a what is he eight nine? Yeah. He's like, like eight or nine, and mm-hmm. she apparently seems to be a single mom. So it's like where is her kid? And then eventually we find there's a woman who is helping take care of him and stuff. Right. But it's helpful just to get that little bit of information. Right. And before we even get there, this uh, we have the gold coin sequence, mm-hmm. where which is also where we get the first swell of the main theme, which is awesome. Mm-hmm. Um. But yeah, he's out on the he's out on the beach looking around. Apparently, it was frigid out there. Oh. Um, and uh, and he sees that shiny little gold coin, uh, which then turns into the piece of wood that just says Dane. Um, and at that point, had Hal Holbrook talked about the Elizabeth Dane yet? Or no? I guess the I guess in the ghost story in the beginning, he had said Elizabeth Dane. Yeah. So so we mm-hmm. knew yeah. that that was something when we see the half aboard. Right. Right. Yeah, I jumped ahead. I was in the scene when she wakes up in the morning and yeah. the kid is there. Yep. But yeah, then he got it, brings that important. to her in bed, mm-hmm. which is a cool thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Ma, check hey, out this old rotten wood I right. found. <laughs> check this thing out. <laughs> yeah, At least it wasn't like a bug or something. <laughs> right. And then he just heads off and he's like, I want to see if there's any more. Get that gold coin. <laughs> oh, he also <laughs> asks, can I have a stomach pounder? And, a <laughs> 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 and I wanted to know what the hell a stomach pounder <laughs> is. <laughs> I imagine it's like the 1980 equivalent of the double down from KFC, where it's like the two, <laughs> the two chicken... <laughs> Breasts are the like are the patty, but I I don't know what a stomach. <laughs> if pounder I is. Google stomach pounder right now, it it auto corrects to stomach pounder and a coke. Aww. <laughs> also, and the mom, his, her answer is after lunch. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it can't pound your stomach that much if you get There's it after some lunch. Modern parenting. <laughs> 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 the the trivia thing when you look it up it says Tommy Wallace claims it is a gym exercise not a food item John Carpenter said it was a joke but he's glad that people still talk about it <laughs> well apparently yeah. there's a book that is a reference to McDonald's quarter pounder or something that makes yeah. sense it's which probably, seems yeah. at odds with the coastal community I don't know anyways it's great yeah but you can't have one till after lunch <laughs> exactly <laughs> it's morning what are you doing man <laughs> She just worked all night. And That's he's true. like, Mom, yeah. I found this board. And hey, can I get the gold coin? And hey, Mom. <laughs> a, f- a funny little thing from the from the director's commentary. Deborah Hill's just uh, the blanket that she's covered up with. She's like, oh, I have that blanket. I still have that blanket. <laughs> Aww. Wait, when, when Stevie Wayne's in bed? Yep. She's also gorgeous. She has beautiful feathered hair. She's yeah. wearing like this light blue lacy little negligee sleeping thing. Yep. I just, she's awesome. She is the she's, quintessential 80s babe. She's just me. so 80s babe-ish. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I don't know if any of you listened to the special featurette with Jamie Lee Curtis. Yeah. Yes. Oh, man. So it sounds like it was uh, pretty difficult. So you're there on a movie set. There's the director. There's the director's ex-wife. And mm-hmm. there's the director's new girlfriend. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Yep. That sounds like hell to me. It sounds super uncomfortable. And they talked about it like they were a family. So they, yeah. like, they thought. When they made of, Halloween. Yeah. Yeah. So at. Yeah, 
very uncomfortable. Yeah, and she's, Jamie says that when um, John and Deborah were breaking up, she said it was like her parents were getting divorced because they had to like sit her down and tell her, by the way, we're breaking up. It's okay. Yeah. Because yeah. she was so young when she did 19. Yeah. yeah. Well, and this was only oh her second God. movie, and it was a couple years later, so she's still like a babe out of water. Like, yeah. literal babe out of, before Fish Called Wanda. Well, <laughs> well, they also pointed out that, like, John Carpenter and Deborah Hill felt bad that she wasn't getting more movie work, so they wrote that part to kind of add her in, which is why her part is kind of small and mm-hmm. ancillary, but... Well, it's really <clears> cool, too, and then, like, her mom, and it's also great, too, that, like, she's freaking Janet Lee from Psycho, mm-hmm. and yeah. that's her mom, and, and also one of the after things that you, some of you already probably watch too was where she mentions like she doesn't like being the her and her mom playing the mother daughter but she doesn't mind being in a movie where they're both in it yep. just not playing the mother and daughter because she said she likes having that mother and daughter moment like actual as actual mother and daughter yeah. right. so I thought the parts with her mother and we haven't even talked about the character her mother plays uh, so it's really I just think it's neat yeah because yeah. they're really only they're together in the church at that's the end a, I think yeah. that's it I think that's it yeah Oh, yeah. All right. So we got this kid. Um, he's home. The mom is awake. And then we move over to Nick and Elizabeth. Um, and they're on the dock. And Nick is worried. He This is Nick Castle, mm-hmm. Tom Atkins. And he's concerned because he knows the guys on the boat should have been back. And the boat is gone. Where is the seagrass? So that begins their epic journey to try to find the seagrass and what happened to it. And <laughs> Jamie Lee Curtis is like, hey, can I stick around? <laughs> and he's like, you got nothing better to do? And she's like, no. So... Yeah, which I just think is really cute. <laughs> and that guy also, when he's con- when he's expressing his concern, that guy does everything he can to brush him off. There's like no, there's no space between their lines. He's just like, I don't know, he's probably drunk somewhere. Don't worry about it. I don't know. We'll come back at some point. Not a big deal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe like, and as far too with the guys drinking on the boat at the beginning, when the seagrass goes before it goes missing and they get murdered. Maybe like just. These guys get drunk on boats and are gone for a night and it's no big deal. But Nick Castle knows it's not true. He's like, no, something's wrong. Right. Yeah. And he's determined and he's super, um, he's super Tom Atkins where he gets all in his like cop mode and he's like, I'm going to find out what happened. Yeah. With his hair and, um, yeah. But then we finally get to meet, um, Janet Lee's character. Janet Lee's character. Yeah. So she is a, a chair lady of, the town. It's she's like a booster really or yeah, she's yeah. So she's co-planning, or she's planning the um, the town centennial, the big anniversary party they're having with the the town turning 100 years old. And there's her, and she has an assistant with her. And they're in, like, just a few what? scenes together. But What a weird yeah. relationship <laughs> that is. It's, it took it's, me a minute to figure yeah. out what was going on. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, it's <laughs> terrific. I think she, I think that she is the... Uh, that's um, Nancy Loomis, I believe, and she's and she was Annie in Halloween. Yeah, and she has some of the funniest lines in the movie to me. She's this perfect foil, mm-hmm. like sarcastic character for this very serious buttoned-up <laughs> Janet Lee character. She's I, in her '80s suit. <laughs> yeah, I love the, I love their dialogue back and forth. It it, it made me laugh a lot. Um, yeah, because she's like super uptight and on point. We've got to plan the thing. And did you order the catalog? Did you yeah. order the candles? And da, da, da. and there's, she's like, "Yes, ma'am. I'm on it. I'm on it." <laughs> there's also that funny little thing where they where they peek under the 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 sheet to look at the statue. Like oh, this is not bad. <laughs> and then they just move on. And then be, me being the an AV person at the library, that like I can hear that the it's supposed to be the AV guys are ringing out the sound system. There's all that feedback that's happening, <laughs> which is which is pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, Matt's like that was great. I prove that. Like, that's what they would do. <laughs> <laughs> so the two, the two of them, they're in a car and they're headed to the church. Uh, they're there to see. Did, now, did they get called to go talk to Father Malone or did he call them in to take a look at the journal? Because they sit around a table and look at the journal. I don't remember how they. I don't did remember that. why they went there. I think that. I think they were going. It, it had something to do with their planning. They had to go talk to him. I just don't remember exactly what the deal was. Oh wait, no. She, they come into the church and they're looking around, and then he emerges from the shadows like a fucking vampire. Oh, that's right, <laughs> like a ghost is, out of the sea. Made me laugh out loud yeah. Yeah. the first time I saw that. And then he jumps on them with the, the yeah. journal. Okay, he's like, "Hey, what's up?" And they did, they did some, some like post production trickery to make that work because, like, they had to basically put a layer over him, like over the film, because otherwise you would have just seen, seen him, him there. Just so waiting. then they have a dissolve that happens so that he can actually <laughs> jump out and scare ah. you. And there's a couple of fake out jump scares in this movie that that I really like. They're they're silly. That's just a, I mean and I don't like a jump scare but some of the ones in here are just like fun. They're great. Yeah. They're what a jump scare should be. Yeah. Yeah, I shouldn't have to wait a half hour for the thing to come out of me. No. Yeah. One thing I really 
thought was cool in including Janet Lee is like in a lot of especially horror movies there's little like homage to other things and like for example there's like a direct lineage between Psycho which has like the male character Sam Loomis and then the doctor in Halloween to Sam Loomis and that also leads later to um uh, Billy Loomis in mm. Scream which also references Halloween a bunch um but I just love that like there's that lineage and then to include Janet Lee from that original movie that mm-hmm. year and I mean I just think that's such a cool little like Easter egg almost yeah well too I mean would she have even been in it if Jamie Lee hadn't been written in by John Carpenter specifically maybe I mean she I think that it, I think he they definitely would have gone after her because they I think it was really exciting for them to work with her and they were mm-hmm. trying to just you know I know that Donald Pleasance was like a really big pull for them in Halloween and I think they were kind of trying to do the same thing with this mm-hmm. where they were like let's get a really big yeah. notable you know actor and and you know have them kind of like you were saying rep- reprise a role almost you know mm-hmm. a little wink and a nod and it still didn't do enough to make people love this movie when it came out or for the people to like it. Mm-hmm. I um, don't get it. I, I What's wrong it, with people? Because <laughs> we know y'all listening out there are just in love with the fog. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I do think it's interesting, though. We don't see this kind of self-referential, uh, these callbacks in Westerns or mm-hmm. action mm-hmm. movies. Yeah. or mm-hmm. I don't think we see it in romantic comedies. You what know, about sci-fi? It's, no? Mm. Sci-fi, I feel like there's more. Because I feel like any speculative fiction is building off of... I'm sure you but, could probably find a lot more stuff like this in sci-fi and horror than any other genre, though. Yeah, but I think it's such an interesting point that in horror you get these. Mm-hmm. It's it's like a whole a whole body that people are drawing from. Mm-hmm. Even even the jump scares. There are real jump scares originally. Then there's the fake jump scare. Then the super long mm-hmm. fake jump scare, and then it's so self-referential now. As soon as someone opens a medicine cabinet. It's like, you know, it's a fake uh-huh. because we've seen so many real ones mm-hmm. already. And anyway, I think it's kind of interesting. Mm-hmm. And then with all the characters you mentioned, mm-hmm. it's it's kind of a neat thing of horror movies. Yeah. Christopher, when you open your medicine cabinet, are you looking for that <laughs> old spice? <laughs> that, right. that green bottle of old spice? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Something else I just wanted to add. I just watched uh, the first four Scream movies last week. I did too. Did you? That's what? really weird. Well, we, well, didn't, we didn't get the memo over here, me and Christopher. <laughs> thanks, thanks for the, the text, you guys. I'm trying to get to the fifth one because um, the podcast, like the horror podcast I love, they have a little cameo in it, which I'm really excited oh, nice. to see. Yeah. Yeah. Um, also, I spent a lot of time on the set of Scream 4 because it was right down the street. It was right over mm-hmm. there. Which yeah. is really cool. Yeah. It's like right off Washtenaw. The, the frat house that I used to, my band used to play shows at is three doors down from that place. Oh, I remember really? When they were when they were shooting that, it was wild. Yeah. That was back when Michigan still had our shit together. That was we so had that much fun. Center program. Oh my gosh. That was so much fun to follow who was going to be where and just. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I also remember the M Live articles about Emma Roberts' 18th birthday at Live. And there's mm-hmm. like all these pictures of her stumbling out. That's funny. <laughs> oh my gosh. I will do that. <laughs> but in the first scream, um, at the end near the end Sydney Prescott is like oh, some she, I forget what the line is but she says something about not wanting to be a bad seed oh oh right oh that's great yeah. see stuff like that this is I mean it's just it's another I guess if you like any sort of like genre or thing or like the culture or the lore it, it's just something to nerd out about something to look for and so when you see those little easter eggs of things you're like yep this is for me they did it just for me <laughs> but it's everybody who's in love with that genre or that format or that whatever you know, it just makes you feel closer to what you're what you're absorbing. Totally. Whether and it's I, a book or a movie. And I think that like things like horror and at least for me, things like heavy metal, it's just usually nerds and geeks are into mm-hmm, that stuff mm-hmm. and they like to feel like they're part of a community. Yeah. So like yeah. horror tends to do that because, you know, my mom doesn't like horror movies. So she, you know, she's not going to feel that sense of camaraderie the way that I will, where it's like, hey, they're talking about that other thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's go on Reddit. Isn't that cool? <laughs> But don't you get it? Yeah. Aww. Uh, so we are at the church. I thought it was fucking weird that Father... Okay, first of all, that Father Malone's grandfather is also Father Patrick Malone. Mm-hmm. But also how, like... I'm sorry, but are priests allowed to fuck? Like, are they allowed to have children? Oh, this is a good point. This seems like a plot hole. Mm. 
again, like same with Elizabeth. I was like, oh, maybe he's like a reincarnation of his grandfather. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> yeah, priests can't have grandchildren. Is he a? But is he a priest or does he? He's just a father. <laughs> He's, he's just a, someone's he's a, dad that hangs out at church. He's not a father. He's just a grandson. I'm telling you, the church parts were my least favorite. They were so not dynamic. Isn't he wearing a collar? Hell Holbrook? So. Yeah, he's a Catholic priest. Well, mm. you know what? He's got a family with some history. We'll just, <laughs> right, I guess right. leave it I, at that. I, I well, clearly be... they're not good people. <laughs> 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 or or particularly Catholic or people. <laughs> well, also, we didn't really mention that Father Malone was <clears throat> was to blame. He was one of the co-conspirators of the original tragedy that's causing all of this to happen now. Mm. So he's... So if we just want to put that on him, if he's a co-conspirator who yeah. helped those men die, then... He's a piece of trash, and mm-hmm. apparently he just, I don't know if he's having kids out of wedlock and who, but. Seems like he is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I feel like, I don't know. He also, they didn't have to write it that way. Like, yeah. also, I don't really care about any of this stuff with the, the the Catholicism and Father Malone and who's banging who to get who. But I feel like they could have been written where it was a different denomination. Like, he, like, they, he didn't have to be in it. Didn't have to be in a church. He could have found this journal somewhere else. You know what I mean? But it makes sense if it's 1880, if you want to think about a person who would have been like a community member or in involved California. in decisions and like being like well respected or like well regarded or whatever. Maybe it would have been like the father, if, you know what I mean, in 1880, mm-hmm. the Father Malone character. Plus, think- horror movies don't have quite the same bite if it's, you know, the Presbyterian minister. <laughs> <laughs> Episcopalian. <laughs> Do you think being a priest skips a generation, or is there a third <laughs> Father Malone in the middle? Like male pattern baldness? <laughs> <laughs> there could be. Or f- being a bad seed. <laughs> it's just funny, because, yeah, they could have just made it a different name, and it would have done the same thing. Yeah. But. It is interesting. I didn't really think about that. It's I not, didn't either. It's not important to the story, but it's just like, now I'm like, huh, huh. <laughs> right. There were a million things like that that <laughs> do not matter at all, but my brain was like, wait a yeah. second, 1880? This is like the youngest town in america (laughs) (laughs) i just think it's yeah but again it's like the story is just it's just a ghost story it's just simple and silly there's weird effects and weird music and weird lighting and you just shadows it's uh, just the simplicity of it i don't think it's i don't think it's smart enough i don't think the film is that smart the story is (laughs) lacking it's more about atmosphere really Mm -hmm. totally the story doesn't if you think about it too much the story makes no fucking sense yeah it's just it's just silly but it's just like fun it's it's just fun i had a lot of fun with it tons of atmosphere that's and yeah and it it, all of that stuff just works so yeah when you drill down too far into it yeah you can probably i mean but that's true of i think pretty much all of john carpenter's movies if you drill down too far it's like laurie throws the fucking knife away yeah after she gets (laughs) michael myers the first time yeah but otherwise you don't have a movie yeah and she said that in the exactly. information or yep. the, the the interview that was on the disc for The Fog. Yeah, she hated that yeah. fact. And she, she doesn't even like this movie. She's yeah. just like, it's not a particularly good movie. Sorry, yeah. John. Or yeah. whatever it was. And she's yeah. like, I can say that now because yeah. of who I am and what, you, what gonna year it is. Was he going to me? Yeah. yeah. Exactly. <laughs> that was so funny. Um, and with this one being so heavily assembled after the fact, mm-hmm. I imagine that you run into way more stuff like that, plot issues and, and weird little priest issues and things like that yeah that's why i wish that the opening scene was later maybe because Mm. it 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 opened up so many more questions for me that didn't matter whatsoever but like my brain just couldn't let go of the little the opening scene in the church or the opening scene of the town going the the framing device of like the 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 old guy yeah Mm -hmm. telling the kids the ghost story i feel like it told me too much and then i was waiting for the plot to catch up later Mm. Well, too, I think with the campfire, I mean, I don't mind at the beginning. It's a fun way to start. But we needed like a short little like three minute scene where we got the town's backstory, like in a short. And it helps to get it at the beginning. That way, when you're meeting these other, when you see Malone with the journal, you understand like, oh, that's related to the ghost story that the guy just told. And then when we, the kid finds the Elizabeth Dane sign, you're like, oh, that's related. So I like that it was a plot device, the campfire story to tell us right at the beginning what the back, the ghost story was. It's also, it's giving you like just this... It's sort of like the 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 quote, and then it's sort of like a pre- like a prequel, or just kind of like a mini story before the story happens. And it's telling you like this is a ghost story. Mm-hmm. This is literally a ghost story, and then everything that comes after it is a simple ghost story, you know, which is exactly what he wanted to John Carpenter wanted to do because he had come up with the idea 
like they were traveling in London or something like that, and he saw a bunch of fog off in the distance and <laughs> had like some stoner thought where he's like, what if, what if there was something in the fog? <laughs> and then they made a movie about it. Yeah. There's always something in the fog. Look for the fog, John. It kind of blew my mind because um, the other thing that I think was like a barrier for me was that I love the Stephen King novella, uh, The Mist. Oh. And so I was comparing the two a lot. Mm-hmm. But um, that short story came out the same year as this movie. So really? both of like John Carpenter and Stephen King are like, what word am I looking for? They're like mulling over the same sort of concept and ideas. Mm-hmm. And both of them are very different, but yeah. Um, all right, so if we're <laughs> Christopher's face right now. No, I'm, just, I'm remembering the mist. <laughs> yeah, I had, to, I had to take a brain second to think about the mist too. But yeah. that's pretty cool. That yeah. the mist and the fog came out in the same year. Right? I didn't realize it was the same that. year. Yeah. It was uh, like a, one of those books that's like a collection of stories right. from a bunch of different authors. It came out in that first, and then he published the novella separately in Graveyard Shift, maybe. Mm. Anyway, that's just, I love Stephen King's short stories, and um, that's one of my favorites. And the movie is good. I like the ending. I like the movie. Brutal. So I think, too, that. Just the thought of like there's something out there. Like every like scary movie, there's something out there. Outside the house, outside here, there's something out there. And with this, I like that the fog or the mist, it's such an expanse. It's this and also it's for this movie, like the fog rolls in, bad things happen, then the fog rolls out and it's okay again. It's like mm-hmm. all the horror is kept within the realm of that the literal fog. It destroys a lot of technology in its wake. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's so many shots of like broken clocks and we're all working on the time episode of Saturday show and I watched it the day after our meeting. I was flipping out. I was like, why? Why? Time is like folding over on itself and everything's related. Dan O'Bannon's in this movie. (laughs) Allison. (laughs) I also had to look up what leprosy was. (laughs) No rough, me. right? <laughs> I guess it's like totally fine now. They can yeah. just like cure you now. They can, but, yeah, but 1880, right. you're fucked. <laughs> you, you're dead. Yeah. You're dead. Yeah, if Ann Arbor thinks it has trouble with affordable housing and zoning. <laughs> 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 I just snorted. <laughs> I can't wait for for that to show up on at a city board meeting (laughs) well i have things to say but i'm not going to say them (laughs) Um. (laughs) okay so we were in the church the journals there we got the father and the the two women and then we're then we cut to a scene back on the boat and so nick and elizabeth are and it feels weird to call them by those two names but nick and elizabeth um our little lovers tryst. Um, they are they're on the boat, and Nick is looking for his friends, trying to figure out like here's the seagrass. It's empty. The guys are gone. Where are the guys? And so then they're just hanging out. I think that the Coast Guard must have dropped them off there, and they're just hanging out waiting. And they're just like in the literal area where the fishermen were murdered. And just, there's no signs of anything. The dial's been broken. There's technology that's been wasted, but they don't know what happened. Like there's corrosion and rust, and Nick is not happy. And he knows something's wrong, but he can't explain it. So then they're just like sitting down there waiting and waiting and waiting. Um, and Nick is telling a story about his father and this gold coin. He tells his own little ghost story. Yeah. Which is super, I see, I, I love the opening and I love that this ends up being like a little companion piece to the opening where it's like, Oh, it's another ghost story that's connected to it. And it's being told by Tom Atkins, who is always great. Mm-hmm. And you're paying and you're paying such close attention to it, but then they're cutting over to the to the locker slowly opening, giving you a nice little misdirect. Yeah, I like this scene a lot. Yeah. And With, as a viewer, you know that that's where the men were murdered or taken away or something happened there. And you're just they're so calm and casual sitting there and you're waiting for that locker to open. You're waiting for something to fall and something to happen. Mm-hmm. I love when the body falls on Jamie Lee Curtis. That was so cool. Yeah. Especially with the misdirect that you mentioned, Matt. Yeah. She's like, I'm going to go to Vancouver now. Yeah. And then she does. <laughs> That's a great line. Also, the, the the face that falls down, the dead body, Ooh, it looks like the mask that Michael Myers is wearing. <laughs> yeah. With the big eye sockets. Yeah, and it looks like, like faces yeah, it's very, thing. it's a very quick shot. But I was just like, oh, really? That's, the, no, I don't like the makeup on that. And her scream, her screams are just yeah. the, the very best ones. You can hear them peeking the shit out of the microphone. It's, 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 it's awesome. It's yeah. awesome. Nobody does that better than her. <laughs> It's amazing. Uh, so they find the body, and then 
Stevie, we finally get a shot of Stevie going to the lighthouse. <gasps> the do best. Her broadcast. Oh, man. Oh, we all freaked out right now. It's yeah. so good. It's so beautiful. The stairs. Down the stairs. Oh, what a fucking dream it would be to have that job. I, that's all I could think the first time I saw it was I desperately wanted this to be a real town that I could go visit. <laughs> it, the lighthouse is real. The lighthouse is real. It's not part of <laughs> a small town there, but like. Yeah, I mean, I've looked up all the locations, and they're all mm-hmm. kind of close to each other. What is it? Inverness, I think, is one of the places. And well, anyway, Point, Point Reyes. Point Reyes, yeah, which is part of Inverness, which is part of... It's like all of the stuff, that, like the um, Stevie's house is is near there, and it's like the, the I guess, like the second second unit crew had been staying there for some other movie and yeah, so it's all kind of nearby, but I wanted it all to exist perfectly in this little town. The church, I guess, is a lot further away, but when you think about this movie and the lighthouse and Stevie's job and everything, what other horror movie has this kind of a setup? I don't know, maybe some of them that I'm not thinking of, but most of them you know, someone's in peril, someone's getting chased the whole time But to have this external character who's kind of narrating and almost overseeing what's going on and giving the viewer information Mm -hmm. and like spotting the fog from a distance and relaying information, Mm -hmm. I I don't know. It's pretty unique, isn't it? You know, in horror movies. Certainly for the time. Right. There's no way. Like, because I I can't think of anything around that time or before that was like that. Right. And she's also kind of removed from the threat in some ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 It's so cool and weird. Yeah. I really like, too, how she's she's so secluded. Like, she has to drive on that long, winding road in the cool orange car, courtesy of KAB. (laughs) And then she's, and then she ends up at the lighthouse with these, like, thousands, what is it? How many stairs? It she said it was. She tons. said it was a beast because when yeah. they were filming it, the crew had to go up and down these stairs. Right. But it's also amazing that she is filming a radio show from a lighthouse. That's like so dreamy. Yeah. Um, but also, she's so secluded. She's literally like there in the middle of nowhere, like so secluded, while her kid is running around, like you know, on the beach collecting like dead bodies. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's. So I just think that it added an air of mystery and like, like you know, something's going to happen. Um, it just adds that sec- the layer of seclusion. It is but- funny that she brought the piece of wood to work with her. Yeah, like, I, don't, I don't understand why she brought the piece of like, wood. Like she's really deliberately carrying it, just like, yeah, well, he brought this to me in bed, so I might as well take it to work. Yeah, it's in the front seat. It's like strapped in a seatbelt. Right, right. But it's again, it's like if you didn't do that, then you wouldn't have a bunch of you wouldn't have a bunch of the movie, basically. But yeah. Well, I love that scene um, where she does have that. The um the half of sign of the Elizabeth Dane and it's sitting next to a radio and she's just you know looking out getting coffee and looking out the window or whatever and then water starts seeping out of the sign, yes. the wooden sign. Water just starts stripping down and I there's another close up of a radio and it drips onto the radio and the radio is speaking. There's like a broadcast happening yeah. and. I love that the sound effect, that the the warped voice that comes out of that radio. It's so it's my one of my favorite scenes. I love the audio in that so yeah. much. Yep, it's really good. Super cool. I couldn't quite catch what. Oh, it's the, a tape player. I'm sorry, it's yeah. a tape player that's yeah. playing like her the advertisement she was going through. It's like the thing that she puts on so that she can go home player. for the night. I also so like how she oh. starts listening to that, like while she's about to like go down these treacherous amount of stairs. <laughs> yeah, she's like, I'm just gonna do some work and listen to these ad placements I have to go through. I think it. I think that they have to leave that on overnight so that there's something playing on the radio all the time the ad yeah it's like a it's like a loop broadcast thing yeah i guess it's a way to since she is she wouldn't be listening to a radio the only radio show that plays is her so if she needs something to have again they this background noise and voice it's a way to have that voice and then also when the water is dripping on this cassette tape and this cassette player Mm -hmm. it's one of those cool old school cassette players um you needed to have that because it wouldn't be her own show. Right. So I guess that's a good way to slip it in. Right. Really cool scene. And when she does her little radio drop where she talks about the Coupe de Ville's, which mm-hmm. was John, what was it? Fictitious Just, band, which went in, then became John Carpenter's band with Nick Castle and Tommy Wallace. Oh. Which they did the, they had like one real song, which was the theme Too Big Trouble in Little China. Did the song that played after she introduced them, it was an actual Not song by them? No, that is, um, I could find it. I have it in my library somewhere, but that's some of that music that was just made by people in the industry. That like It's like a funk song. It's one of the best songs that they did, but I can't remember what they called mm, themselves. That's so cool. And then there's the morgue scene. <laughs> Ooh, another good scene. This is a really good one. I love when his foot 
like your the camera's underneath the gurney or whatever, and his foot comes down. That was awesome. Mm-hmm. I only know it is creepy. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> yeah, one thing this movie really excels at is like a really eerie, like creepy atmosphere, and that was when it was like most heightened for me. It was like the feet coming down, and you just know that he's. Uh, Mm -hmm. Like, she's in the room alone with him. Just Uh. leaving her in trouble again. Yeah. Yeah. But you know what? She's not afraid. She's just kind of, she's kind of a badass. Like, Mm -hmm. she's just like, eh. And also, she gets to scream again. Exactly. Which is awesome. I also love the line, uh, Dave Baxter died in the ocean. Because he's talking about how his body's all decomposed Mm -hmm. or whatever. Yeah. Oh, so that, so yeah. So, fun fact, the, the guy's body, that is, is his name Al? He is the husband of our chair lady played by Deborah Lee. And her name's not Kathy. What's her name? I'm calling her Kathy. I think it is Kathy. <laughs> no, it's not. You guys said it earlier, and I said, no, that's Janet doesn't... Lee. Kathy Williams. Oh. That's her character name in that. What were we talking about earlier? And Christopher, you said her name was something else. And I said, wait, her name should be something like Kathy. <laughs> we were <laughs> really talking was... about Elizabeth. Elizabeth. That's... Elizabeth. That was Elizabeth. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, you, yeah. you yeah. said if it was the 80s. It would have been Kathy. Name, right, oh, right, right, right. Like, well, the, Janet the Lee way. is Kathy <laughs> Williams. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even remember her name being Kathy. <laughs> that's so funny. See? Kathy is a great 80s name for 1980. Holy Toledo. My brain must have heard that in the movie and put it away. (laughs) Well, and here again, we we just know of the gore. We don't see it. Doesn't the coroner say something like, you know, double ocular something? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Fancy way to say, dude, this guy's eyes got Both of his eyes were taken out. (laughs) Oh, by a (laughs) fish. Oh, that is, I didn't catch that because yeah, you mentioned earlier, Matt, the kill scene with the eyes. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the husband of the chair lady. It's Al, right. I think, Al. Right. Yeah. Right. Which, which when he's laying in the boat and they're talking about, I don't really, I, I, he's basically, he stopped <laughs> short of calling his wife a battle axe. <laughs> essentially. <laughs> is he, is he the one that says, uh, when, when someone else says, aren't you happily married? Not so says, happily. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's right. That's right. And uh, we, you, you don't realize that he's referring to <laughs> Janet Her. Lee's character. Yeah. But yeah. Because you yeah. don't picture you wouldn't picture them together because she's just so like straight laced and like, you know, buttoned up and And he's um, drunk on a boat. Yeah, I mean because. Yeah. Yeah. Oh sorry. That <laughs> was you do. bad marriage counseling right there on our part. Um so after the mog after the after the mog, after the after the morgue scene, we finally hear it. We finally hear the foghorns. There are foghorns. Um, which means something might be rolling in. Could it be a bank of some sort? <laughs> um, and then it's late, and we are at the anniversary ceremony. So our chair lady Kathy um, is doing her thing. She's at the, and that is where we find out about the dead bodies that were found upon the the sea grass. Oh yeah, right. Yeah, this, yeah we we get a, more of the trickle information from Hal Holbrook slowly reading that that journal. Yeah. So. Um, this is like thing, things are starting to happen. Things are culminating. There's the anniversary scene, the anniversary celebration scene, and then at the same time, there's the they're in a bar, and the chair lady, That's where they find out that the chair lady's husband Al is the one who died. Um, Nick calls Stevie at the station and says that he's dead. And then there's a fog warning announcement on the radio. So this is where things are starting to kind of happen in quick succession. Yeah, I think it's like cool characterization that we like have those little moments where Al and uh, Janet Lee's character's relationship is fleshed out and I think it makes a lot of sense that after she learned that he is dead she's like well I signed up to give this speech so I'm gonna go ahead and give it yeah. sucks that my husband's dead but I gotta keep on keeping on <laughs> but that goes with her character you know because she worked so hard and ordered all those candles <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and she we'll approved that the statue. Candles, <laughs> then I'll go home and pass out. That That's was another right. really funny line. Yeah. Um, I also really liked, uh, I thought it was weird at first because of the like very obvious age gap, but um, Nick Castle and Elizabeth, their relationship is actually pretty sweet. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. He I doesn't, don't, go ahead. He doesn't appear to be like a creep. No. You know? Oh, he's a good guy. He mm-hmm. might be weird, like he yeah. said, but he's a good guy. He's cares Tom, about his he's, friend. He's Tom Atkins. Yeah. He, the only thing is he drinks and drives. Yeah. <laughs> and drives. Yeah. 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 He also does not smoke enough in this movie for the <laughs> typical um, character. <laughs> for him, anyway. Don't smoke. Um, yeah. So All of the fog effects are so cool, especially in this moment. Um, like the fog rolling underneath the door. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
And yeah, just that it glows is like a really interesting and unique effect. Very cool lighting. Makes it look extra spooky. Uh, so we find out, I have two notes where I put, he's toast, referring to two different dead men. Um, <laughs> <laughs> toast all around. So um, after the, so Nick from the bar calls Stevie at the station about the fog warning. And then Stevie Wayne calls her, her weatherman, Dan, um, about the fog and the report. And this is where Dan, when the fog rolls in around Dan's house, there's a bang on the door. I want to go back just a few minutes to where the water was leaking out of the driftwood, oh, out of the yeah. piece of the ship. Mm -hmm. Because at that point, the message on the wood changes oh, yeah. from Elizabeth, remember? From Dane. Or, from Dane. To six must die. To six must oh, die. Oh, good, good call. Which is a, a crucial part of the plot, I think. So now we're going to start keeping track of how many people the fog or whatever's in the fog has killed. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then the dead guy in the morgue writes a three on the ground, which I didn't catch till the oh, second right. time My I watched. God, no, right. that's a hook. That's a three. Is it it's a three? A three. Oh, a three I thought it was supposed to be three more. I thought it was supposed to be the hook. Nope. Uh, oh. It's a three. You know what I didn't understand though is like, obviously they need six uh, so in the novelization or something, they explain that it's six descendants of the original six co-conspirators. But can they kill other people? Like, I don't think they ever really establish if it's like, you know, I don't think that John Carpenter or Deborah Hill or whoever else helped write this ever established that. I don't know about the, I don't know who wrote the novelization. I'm going to guess Alan Dean Foster because he wrote every novelization. They tend to embellish that kind of stuff uh, in there and add a lot of little details just so that it's little Easter eggs for people. But I don't know if they ever fleshed the, out that specific rule that had to be descendants. Mm -hmm. I see. Because I don't because because that wouldn't explain killing. I'm jumping ahead, but Ow. the old lady or or Dan for that matter, right? I. I didn't catch this when I watched it, but I saw something online about how one of the characters who dies has like a line earlier where they talk about like their like family history being in the town or like mm. they're like there's like some little small like line about how they're a descendant of like the founders or something like that. I, I feel, remember don't that. you feel like Father O Malone? Malone, Father Malone, sorry. Oh, Mally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Kenny O'Malley. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I feel like Father Malone is alluding to that, though, because doesn't he say something? I mean, he's always referencing his grandfather, and I feel like he is saying something about descendants. Anyway, I'd have Maybe. to rewatch it. I, I guess I don't specifically remember it, but. He's like, I can't read anymore after that. Uh, how about you try? <laughs> yeah. Why? They're coming. <laughs> They're here. They're in town killing your townspeople. Yeah. <laughs> this information seems to die with you, so you should probably find the rest of it out. <laughs> Did you find anything in the wiki? Um, no, I was just, I also feel like when I was looking for a synopsis to go with today, there's a couple different things about mm. like the like the descendants or who are the six are supposed to be um, yeah. versus like the, the campfire on the beach being like the fog, the fake um, beacon. And that's why the ship crashed into the, the rocks and like, so, mm -hmm. but again, it's not a cerebral film. It doesn't need to, but it's just something to think about. Cause again, as like intelligent horror movie watchers were like looking for all the pieces and all the things. <laughs> <laughs> trying to make sure it all makes sense. Yeah. But, but this yeah. is 1980 and it's just, <laughs> I'm right. trying to um, distill this into a spreadsheet real quick. Yeah. <laughs> and Allison's working very hard on that. Yeah. Well, mostly I couldn't tell what the stakes were. Like yeah. I was really scared for the little boy, mm -hmm. but like, well, his nanny, his nanny gets murdered. Yeah, but is she, like, she's old. <laughs> yeah. Maybe yeah. she's from there. You know what I mean? Like, I just couldn't tell, like, what the stakes were for some of the characters. Because if they're only looking for Well, because the fishermen, the oh. fishermen died. Two fishermen that left, that was three. Oh. Then you only need three more, which are Dan, the nanny, and then don't say who dies at the end. <laughs> or supposed to die at the end. Because we'll get there in a moment. Mm -hmm. um, so, is the fog still here? Are we here? The fog is here. Bang, bang, bang on the door. So Dan's Dan's <clears throat> dead. Dan is toast, according to my notes. Um, Which, Stevie knows something's terrible, and so she calls the sheriff. She can't get through. She's trying to like save the day. This is where her mega saving the day comes into further effect. 
There's a funny point in the audio commentary. Where, actually, there's several points where John Carpenter kind of hilariously refers to the desk. He's like, oh, well, here's where Chuck buys the farm. Mm-hmm. Here's where she bites the dust. <laughs> and he does it like at the beginning of the scene, which is very funny because it just quickly spoils it. That's adorable. Yeah. I want to watch a movie with him. <laughs> it's, I, yeah, his commentaries are great. They're fun. I've only really seen like video of John Carpenter from like the last 10 years or whatever, but he just seems like someone's grandpa, someone's Mm -hmm. nice grandpa who like made these movies. All he wants to do anymore is play video games and make music with his kid. I think it's his son and his godson are the people that help him make music now. He seems really happy, which is awesome. That sounds like your future. I fucking (laughs) hope so. (laughs) Didn't John Carpenter and his kid make the music for the new Halloween movies? The new Halloween movies, all kinds of stuff. Ah. Yeah, the new Halloween movies. They also have been just releasing original music like that that they called Lost Themes. It was all stuff for like imaginary movies and they're great. I went and saw them at the Majestic a couple of years ago um, where they were essentially playing like every great theme he's ever written and he looked like he was having the time of his life. So, yeah. Dude, the music in this is so incredible. I think it's one of the best parts of this movie. Mm -hmm. It It would be a totally different movie without that score. That main theme is the best. I just, I love it. I mean, he's obviously a really great director. Like, this movie looks so good, mm-hmm. but the music is incredible. Yep. I think just the combination of those the sweeping shots, the darkness, the the strange story, mm-hmm. and then the music. Like it would be it If it was Yakity Sax, it wouldn't, sax, it it wouldn't work. work. <laughs> it would just be, oh, it's a bad movie, but it's really a bad movie. Right. You know? Right. Yeah. I'm still sad that people didn't like it and that he didn't like it. It's I don't a, understand so it. It's, I just yeah. You know, you're wrong. It's great. In my humble opinion, can't wait till we get to rate this. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So what's happening? My notes are: this lady has got to be one of the dumbest people on earth. No. <laughs> Which okay. Lady? So no. All right, Allison. <laughs> oh, the old she, lady. Yeah. <laughs> oh wait, no. The, but the fog rolls in before we get to her house. Um, the fog starts rolling into the lighthouse. Before mm-hmm. we go to the lady who's getting about to get... Oh, does it? Mm-hmm. The fog rolls into the lighthouse and the power goes out. So, um, oh, around it? Or, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, and the power goes out. This is before she like tries to do the generator and stuff. Mm-hmm. So fog rolls into the lighthouse. So things are happening there on Spivey Point. And then we're at the house with the lady. And she is the dumbest lady. I thought you were, gonna, I thought you were talking about Stevie Wayne being the dumbest lady. Oh, no. I, you mean the nanny. Dude, she's so beautiful. Get... She could do anything. <laughs> okay. That's why I was like, shut up. Don't even... Stevie Wayne is about to save the day. <laughs> Well, and then the kid says, but I want to see who's yeah. there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> With the door just like flung wide open. Oh, it gave me so much anxiety. Yeah. God. Yeah. Maybe he's going to get delivery of stomach pounders. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. I mean, it's after lunch now. It's dark. Yeah. It's dark. <laughs> nighttime stomach pounder. <laughs> yeah. And he pounded a couple of Cokes. In the meantime, yeah. he's got plenty of energy to get the door. That's right. Um, and again, there's a, there's a knock. There's that bang. I love how these ghosts freaking knock. And then you see so much fog and the shadows and then... Someone else bites the dust. I yeah. fully believe that if the ghost at the door had a few gold coins, the kid would have just willingly gone with him. Like, oh, sick. You're a pirate yeah. and you're the yep. one with all the money. Right. Yeah. Cool. One of those coins. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the blank white van, like the unmarked white van that's yeah. in the driveway. <laughs> yeah. um, it's got a pirate ship on the side of it, Allison. Right. Like, hey, kids, get yeah. your coins. <laughs> and he's like, gee, mom, that would be great. <laughs> he hops in. It's 1980. <laughs> This scene was like the most stressed out I was for the entire movie because I was like really attached to the little boy. Mm-hmm. I was just like kid actors in general. He was a fairly good one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. And I yeah I just felt for him. Although this scene did remind me a lot of Halloween because it's like a babysitter and the kid and the like faceless thing comes to the door. When you also have Adrian Barbo's character like like saying. The fog's going around the house. Get out of the fucking house. So you have that added, like, stress level. Mm -hmm. And I can't can't remember off the top of my head right now, is it that they're just not hearing that radio broadcast at the house? Did she, like... The power went out or whatever, didn't it? Maybe. There's no... But the radio would still work without power. Right, because most of them seem to have those little transistor radios. Oh, yeah, because the fog just fucks with all technology seemingly uh-huh. so maybe that was yeah so so she didn't hear the radio broadcast right, right. others others heard it the ones who are heading to rescue our child so nick and elizabeth of course um 
are going to be the ones to go to the house and rescue the son. Right. Which was also, like, so cute and nice. Yeah. This new couple, they're like, yeah, we're going to go save this fucking We kid. heard the thing. Let's go do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> so is Jamie Lee Curtis and Adrian Barbeau ever on screen at the same time? No. Only in the no. church. At th- oh, no. No. Which nope. is kind of funny. Yeah. Anyway, it just kind of fits in with her whole sense of how tense it was sometimes on the set. Yeah. yeah. That is yeah. interesting. <laughs> John Carpenter and all his ladies. Oh, <laughs> he was a handsome man. I'd keep him separate. Was he? I've only seen pictures of him at like 70 years old. I thought old. that was a jet. <laughs> well, you saw him at the beginning yeah. as Bennett. Oh, yeah. I mean, he, he looks like everybody's dad. Yeah. <laughs> he's, just, he's just a 70s dude. He's just a classic dad. Yeah. I only know him with white hair. Yeah. What he looks like now. <laughs> That's so funny. Um, so, yeah, Stevie's panicking over the radio trying to warn them. He's about to get rescued. So Nick and Elizabeth, before they go to rescue the kid, they actually go to the weather station to kind of get information and... Dan O'Bannon is uh, is dead. He's not there. Um, it cracked me up. his body there? Did they see his body there? Or no, is he gone? Uh, I can't remember. I just know he, I have a note that he's like, next stab. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think it's just empty. And then they take off running and then they just go right to the, the kid's house and then save the kid. And Jamie Lee Curtis is in the truck and she's trying to get in reverse. And like, of course, the, the ghosts are there. Oh, and yeah. she's trying to drive that beat up old blue pickup truck. <laughs> Dude, they get there just in time. When yep. he knocks out that window and grabs the kid. Oh, my God. Mm-hmm. I did hate the I hate the like horror movie trope of the car not starting. It's like, yeah. oh, it's always so stressful. They called like, it a mud trap shot is yeah. what they, they refer to that sequence as. Yeah, but it's just like. It's got to, st- I mean, you need that. You just need yeah. that extra moment of a like. tension. And as you said, Allison, this whole scene of like the kid being in the house and the, the mom is panicking over, literally over the radio. Like, he's alone. The fog is coming. Somebody get my son, Andy, Andy. And then like they rescue him and like he's still in danger because the car won't start. Yeah. It's just a good heart pounding little. Yes. Yeah. I do like that it gives the ghosts an opportunity to show off like how slowly they move and they're mm-hmm. always in the fog like they're always silhouetted in the fog. That was really cool. I liked that shot, but yeah. just that trope in general. I'm they remind me of enough. like they're literally just like a black figure in the so it reminds me of the shape like with yeah. just Michael Myers shape uh. just they're like standing still a lot mm-hmm. and just staring at you with like just blackness. There's no eyes. There's no it's just a black shape. Well, so no eyes yet. Think of, yeah. Right, no eyes until later. That was added yeah. later. Right. <laughs> oh, that right, was right. added in post to make it scary <laughs> yeah it worked <laughs> yeah i oh, like that it's so funny um so what else well i also just love how slow equals scary yep mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. you know in nature that's not the case it's not like the lion is extra <laughs> scary for creeping up slowly but that's how humans view it mm-hmm. it's like that you know like for me frankenstein and the mummy were the scary ones because they're creeping so slowly, especially mm-hmm. the mummy. Oh, my God. I think it's just, like, such a cool concept, like, this slow, never-ending threat. And right. I think you can see it in, like, you see it in a lot of early zombie movies, especially, like, Romero zombies. They never, like, fast zombies are scary in a different way, but, like, uh, theoretically, just an unnatural force that never stops. Um, and then you see that in like It Follows or something like that later. Right. Mm-hmm. It just shows how like time and stillness can be scary while you're waiting. Like it's the unknown. You don't know how long that that time plus, will be. Plus, I think it gives your mind more time to freak out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, more time to worry about what's coming. And I think even in this scene, don't they look out the car windows and all of a sudden there are like six or seven There's figures. A, and they're closer. There are right. six of yeah. them because the six are coming back to kill the six. <clears throat> ah. Oh. Wait, are there six ghosts or are there six co-conspirators? I think there's more than six. Oops. I think more there's than six? more than six of the ghosts. It's like one I of the six? I think. The one with the sword is my favorite ghost. It's the, it's the number of men. Well, that, yeah. It's the one that, <laughs> <laughs> He's cool. He's got a fucking sword. <laughs> <laughs> the anniversary ceremony is ending. The night is heading by. It's still dark. It's still foggy. Um, our chair lady, Kathy, she decides to let her assistant bring her home. So she's on her way home. Stevie's in a full panic on the radio warning everybody, you know, that the fog, the huge, fo- it's a fog warning, fog alert, fog alert. And she's... <laughs> 
So this is one thing I don't understand. She is able to know exactly where the fog is moving yes. down the street. Yes. I'm like, do you have like a Google map you are looking to know which direction? She's like, this street, that street. And then she says, everybody go to the church. It's the only place the fog is not. Yes. Can someone tell me how, what, what, Matt, what, somebody. What's Alan. extra funny about that is that if you look at where the lighthouse is positioned, <laughs> yes. it's below it's the town, so oh, it's, it it's, doesn't make you? any sense. But and Dan is dead, so like she has no connection to the weather. All of a sudden, anymore. she's a weather expert, and knows exactly where the travel, the, the fog is traveling up and down the road. And not to mention, there's actually when she that awesome scene where she's going down the hill to the lighthouse. Like most of the windows are blocked out, and you yeah. can see that. So I don't know if she like at night takes them down so that she can perfectly monitor exactly where the fog is going in town. <laughs> but again, this is another one of those. If if you dove too far into that in the movie, then you don't yeah. have a movie anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. I no, I agree. <laughs> I, I love funny. it though. Yeah. It yeah. also cracks me up because like there is no technology even today that can track fog. Like, yeah, I know, yeah, exist. yes. The fog radar <laughs> thing made me laugh a lot because it showed just like there was just a big area on the fog radar. That like, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I know that that's a fog bank. <laughs> Watch. And then that does exist. And somebody writes to us. Yeah. No, <laughs> I was looking it up. You looked it up? Okay. Yeah. They talk about how like fog can't move against the wind. Like Dan's trying to tell her, it can't right. go. He's just going west. Mm-hmm. It can't go against the wind. What kind of fog you knowing about? Right. And then right. she's like, well, but it is. So yeah. like, riddle yeah. me that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It adds for another great, like, tense scene of them driving yep. in a truck yeah. to try to escape. And you can see the fog is basically <clears throat> chasing them. Yeah. And they don't know what's going on. They're just w- trying to get away from the fog. And then, so they're all heading to the church. And they do all end up at the church. So we've got our two ladies, the chair lady and the, the assistant. You've got Nick and Elizabeth. And then you've got the kid. And the kid's name is Andy. I don't know if he even said his name yet. Our adorable young child. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> Stevie Wayne's son's name is Andy. They're all at the church with Father Malone. That is six people. Six people are at the church, um, and then there's a scene. It was at this point where I was like, shit, this movie's really picking up. This is awesome. Then I like looked to see how much time was left. It was like, there's 10 minutes left. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, a lot of stuff, it's like, boom, it like quickly comes together. Like once, you know, you we find, that, or when Dan gets murdered, and then there's yeah. a ceremony, things just kind of, they do. it does pick up. Basically, when it goes to nighttime is when it's just like, okay, here comes yeah. the climax of the movie. Yeah. And the movie is, what is it, 90 minutes? So it's Perfect pretty. Perfect 90 minutes. Yeah, yep. dude, I, I love, love a 90 shorter. minute movie. Yes. Hell 90 minutes. Yeah. 90 minutes all the way. Take note. Nowadays, it would be like three hours long. No. Yeah. <laughs> no. The movie's as slow as the ghost. <laughs> Dive into the backstory of the nanny. <laughs> or we've everybody packed into the church. Yep. The fog is rolling in. The church is the only place that's safe. And then we get back to the lighthouse. And I love these scenes. The music is literally going boom, boom. And you can your heart just starts beating. It's just amazing because it's scary and you don't know what's going to happen. She's trapped there. It's mm-hmm. spooky. It's perfect. Like you have the tension of her trying to start the generator like and then she then she's on the fucking roof yeah in, in, so isn't good. she in heels on the roof yep oh my god yeah because the heels stop her yes. on the ladder yeah. uh, the first time she goes up there those stairs with those heels yeah and that feathered hair the hell was she thinking? love her <laughs> <laughs> she's adrian barbeau yeah um and then so we've got the scene where they're in the church and They've got to get the journal. They've got to, the journals there. They're reading the journal to learn about what's going on. And then the, the ghosts arrive. Captain Blake and the men are there. They start punching through the windows. They move the wardrobe <laughs> away from another window to cover a window, <laughs> yeah. which then gets punched out. Again by Tommy Wallace with his <laughs> with his spooky ghoul hands. Aww. But there's also this scene where they leave the journal in the other room. Mm-hmm. Remember Oh. And Nick has to go get it. Right. I think it's just a way to split the characters in different rooms to make me scary. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they also, they want to get the journal because they have to, they're reading it to try to find clues and how to, what's, why is, you know, and then they learn about the gold. Right. Right. Yeah, I. And Father Malone, like, stole the gold. Like, kind of a weird misdirect. It's just like, <laughs> I, I would have cut that, well, that little bit out. Yeah. yeah. Honestly, a lot of the events of this movie are, like, 100% random. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the movie should be like 30 minutes. <laughs> um, but that, I mean, it is neat though because you, you do need to get the journal and right. it does that, that that separation, the character in different rooms and Andy's like, Nick, ah, father. Like you've got that, like right. people in different rooms, you got to get people together. There's only six people. Um, but then that's how you found out that um, they're trying to, there's a, 
they get the gold cross because they realize that the the gold that Father Malone's grandfather, Father Malone from 1880, stole the gold and they melted it into this cross. Yeah. And so then there's that trippy scene with cross. The cross would be like 400 pounds in real life. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. And the father's just standing there holding this clo- this cross. Um, and I, then it, I think it's like a really interesting concept of like so often throughout history church is like a sanctuary where you go like to escape persecution or like some other like horrible shit that's going to happen to you so i love that they all come to the church and then all of the scenes of the hands coming through the like stained glass windows i love that imagery but i think it's also interesting that like inside the church you find out that oh actually father malone OG is like the bad guy and caused all of this to happen and mm-hmm. is actually like a yeah. shitty person. Yeah. It also, um, I'm going to try to avoid spoilers, but it reminded me so much of the plot of Frozen 2, which is so much about <laughs> like... Frozen 2? Frozen 2, yes. It's not a great movie, but some of the concepts in it are really interesting and it's about like... Um, There's a bad priest? No, it's... Have any of you, okay, Christopher or Matt, have any of you seen Frozen 2 or have a desire to watch Frozen 2? I haven't seen either of them. Do we care if there's a spoiler? Do you want to tell us? Yeah, okay. So All right, guys, kids. Do you mind? <laughs> yeah, children. <laughs> do you guys know the plot of Frozen 1? Yeah. I, I have no care about Frozen whatsoever. I'm sorry. So Elsa has powers. She, like, l- has been locked away in the castle. She leaves because she, like, is afraid she's going to hurt people. And then her sister, like, convinces her to come back. That's the whole plot of the first one. The second one... Um, oh, and Elsa becomes queen because their parents die in a shipwreck. Oh, in no. In the second one... Was it on the Elizabeth Dane? No. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people think it's the shipwreck Is she a leper? Tarzan. <laughs> <laughs> That's her powers. Like, she touches anyone, they fucking... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Now I want to watch yeah. Frozen 2. <laughs> Dude, Frozen 2 is not... It's not my favorite movie. I love mm. the first one. But um, it's interesting because, like, basically Elsa hears this, like, call this like voice in the wind and so she has to go out into the woods by herself because she won't accept fucking help ever to like find these four spirits or whatever it doesn't fucking matter but anyway she finds the shipwreck that her parents died in Mm. and realizes that not her parents but her grandparents her grandfather when he was king made a pact with the native people who live in arendelle and then um, went back on his word and slaughtered them. Wow. And so there's like this disconnect between the native people who live in Arendelle and um, the like people who live in the town now, which of course they're all white people. And then of course the native people are not. But so much of the movie is about like finding out that your ancestors did this terrible mm-hmm. shit in the past and trying to figure out, is there even a way that we can right this wrong after so many years mm-hmm. have passed and so much like terrible shit has come from this, mm-hmm. like what can we do in order to help like heal these wounds and move forward together? Mm-hmm. It's it's interesting. When I feel like with characters who do have a rich history of their, their ancestral line and things happening, like that's that's happened across history. But I think too that yeah, that kind of explains like with Father Malone why he's standing there and why he's he's basically sacrificing himself because he knows what his family did and then it's their fault and he wants to correct he wants to try to correct that wrong. Mm-hmm. And see, that's why I love horror movies. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Because it's because, and they're being serious. <laughs> I am serious yeah. because there's there's an amazing story and how it relates to today and morality. Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. like, oh right. You know, early settlers in California screwed over, Mm -hmm. in this case, it was the lepers, but that's, you know, it would be probably uh, indigenous people because California was a slaughter. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's just fascinating to look at how, and also it's a ghost story. What Mm -hmm. are ghost stories? They're the uh, unquiet dead who still have unfinished business Mm -hmm. or who want their revenge on someone. Right. They want justice. Yeah. And that's that's why I love horror movies. Anyway, <laughs> so it kind of reminded uh, a couple of things about this movie reminded me of Poltergeist um, and like the what you find out at the end of Poltergeist. But I also feel like this movie is like a perfect introduction to horror, especially for younger people, because 
I personally didn't find this movie that scary, but the imagery is so good. Mm-hmm. I feel like this is like a perfect stepping, like a uh, s- starting off point for the young horror viewer. Yeah. Cool. It, fe- it feels like a YA novel mm-hmm. in some ways. And I don't mean to put it down, but that's no. kind of how it feels like yeah. pirates, fog, yeah. you know, some horror, nothing uh, too graphic that you see, mm-hmm. you know, the kids are in it. I don't know. It's yeah. suspenseful. It's dark. It's not, there's no like blood and right. there's a little bit of guts later, but yeah. I like that. That's a good point. There are a couple things like, you know how Poltergeist has the mirror scene? Yeah. The green face a little bit later. The worm face guy. Whew. Oh my I, God. <laughs> I love that chicken face scene in Poltergeist. It's a Rob Bottin effect. <laughs> Freaking love oh, it. Yeah. Rob, Bo- yeah, he, Rob Bottin was also the sword ghost yep and he did th- and then he went on to have a really awesome career after this Aww. this is like one of the first things he did makeup effects for oh it did crack me up like do the ghosts want gold or do they want revenge <laughs> they want their gold back i think is part of it yeah because the the like guy that was negotiating with the people from the town was a per- was someone of means was mm-hmm. what they said so and that he had gold that he was going to pay them so I think that they were like, oh, cool, he's got gold, let's fucking kill him. They're lepers, we don't want them in town anyway. So they wanted their gold back, but ultimately, as we see at the very end, they more just wanted revenge. Yeah. But, you know. Okay, consider this. You are a ghost. What are you going, what's the first thing you're going to buy with your reclaimed gold? New skin. Stop. <laughs> 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 I don't know. A cool house on that beautiful, beautiful coast. I don't know. Dude, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> stomach pounders. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> stomach pounders. Yeah. 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 Well, they, yeah. Did, he just, they just want it back because it was taken from them. It doesn't matter what mm-hmm. I'm going to do with it. You stole it from me. I want it back. Right. Like, you he, made it into a cross, you yeah. asshole. <laughs> did they, was there a shot in the few scenes in the church earlier? Was there a shot of the gold cross like on the wall or on the altar or anything? No, because it was like in the brick. Yeah. Like they, they had to pulled pull it out, brick like, away. Oh, to pull oh yeah, it, yeah. And, and it was covered in like a, a shitty cloth and stuff. So if, if the old Father Malone hid it with the diary. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And okay. left it all fingerprinty. Wow. <laughs> I like it. I want to totally do that. And I also want to watch it with the, the commentary, Matt. You've, it's great. It's I, great. I've seen it so many oh, times, man. but I just want yeah. to watch it with some of the commentary. Yeah. Because I only like doing that if that's a movie I've already known. I know he's I've seen re- a lot. And John Carpenter is really exhaustive about telling you where things were shot. Mm-hmm. So like, for example, that the, the scene with Tom Atkins and Jamie Lee Curtis when they're in bed. When they are showing them in bed, that is in one town in California. When they're showing the door with the silhouette, that is in another town in California. Hmm. So they're like jumping back and forth between Mm -hmm. all these locations and like like everything else with this movie. It all came together with the edit. Well, and too, as a film nerd who likes paying attention to the next, knowing those weird facts about how things were made, when I listen to like a, a commentary, that's what I want. Yep. I and he gets to... down into like what type of film it was shot on and why he likes that and like yeah. yeah it's 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 very cool and Deborah Hill is also there to offer all kinds of great color commentary. She's she's equally awesome. Yeah. All right, so we've got the ghost of Blake, we've got Father Malone, the gold cross, things are about to go down. Well, that is happening. Concurrently, Stevie is on top of the literal lighthouse um on Spivey Point. And the ghosts and their hooks are coming after her. Yeah. And it's great. And then there's a scene we've alluded to where you finally see a close-up of the face of one of the ghosts. It's awesome. It's so gruesome. It's like, it's green. There's like worms coming out of it. It's just, it's a quick shot. And it was added like in post. It was one of the, how the movie came together in editing. But it's it's the first time we've seen a face. It's just so good because it does give the, the extra creepiness, you know, that the movie did, I don't want to say lacked because I didn't need that that this to exist. But it just added the extra of like. Ugh. Well, they, and they did that intentionally because at the time they were competing with a really like this was when Friday the Thirteenth and movies like that were coming out. So they were at initially like basically any scene that is in it that is gory or like a stab or whatever was added in the reshoots because they wanted to make sure that they could compete with where horror movies were going. So I saw this really cool, cool YouTube video about the fog and in it they talk a lot about how like Halloween so changed the horror genre in general and everything was a lot more like bloody, gory, nasty. And so like a lot of the reason why the fog didn't work in 
Carpenter's eyes was that like he had changed the genre so much that it no longer sort of fit with where horror was going in general, which mm-hmm. I think is really cool. And the kind of stuff that him and Deborah Hill grew up on in the 40s and the 50s where it was just like, boo, kind of, <laughs> kind of scary, you know? <laughs> I feel like this movie really fits in with that era of like 50s and 60s, like, yeah, yeah, which I love. Yeah. It's a ghost story. It's it it's, is, it's yeah. basically just a ghost story. They, it could have, this could be rated PG, you know what I mean? Like you could, you could have made it so like PG, but in ghost stories are supposed to be scary. Campfire ghost stories are supposed to scare you, but they're just a story that you know is not real. But it's still just enough to spook you up before you have to go to bed. You know, like scary, spooky stories tell, or scary stories tell in the dark, things like that. <laughs> I do think that this would have gotten a PG-13 rating had that been a thing. But it got an R rating instead because mm-hmm. it was too much for a PG rating. Yeah, because this was like four years before PG-13, I think. Something like that. Because that yeah. was, I think, wasn't it Temple of Doom was the first PG-13 movie? I'm not sure. Really? I think it was, but... Yeah. I do love the the green face is really unexpected, especially because we've seen no physical aspects yeah. of the ghosts mm-hmm. yet. Um, yeah, I was pretty shocked by that. And it's super gross. I also, I love the red eyes. Like when they have the glowing red eyes. I do too. I didn't know that they added that. I thought that was just so cool. <clears throat> yeah, it looks great. Oh, and the gold cross when, like, when they decide up. to hug it out. <laughs> yeah, and it lights up. They're hugging it out on the cross. <laughs> when Blake's eyes turn red, they're glowing. Yeah. yeah. As they're, like, both holding this cross. Yeah. <laughs> it actually did remind me of Indiana Jones. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was cool, though. Yeah. Because, again, it's like that this ancient history. Interesting. Yeah. And you're just waiting for them to both explode at that point. Yeah. And <laughs> they basically do, like... The ghost disappears. After Tom Atkins pulls Hal Holbrook away, though. Yeah. He saves him. I thought maybe, like, I thought that the cross glowing would be, like, the curse is lifted or something. But you're right. He fucks it up right at the end. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, which gives us the really good ending, a second layer. Mm-hmm. Hell yeah. Which, um, is that hell. the next night? What? What's when, that? When the ghosts come back, is it the next night? Or just the father? I th- I thought it was... Happening immediately after. I thought it was like basically after, after like, all right, guys, see you later. That was cool. And then. Yeah, I see. So the, the, yeah, Blake disappears after the cross lights up. Um, the ghost disappears. The fog lifts. They're at the church. And then um, Stevie Wayne is still on the top of the lighthouse. And she's there when all the fog lifts and the ghosts go away. And then she's able to go back, you know, and be a radio host again. So she hops on the radio and she's giving kind of a, a calm <laughs> recap, like something came out of the fog and tried to destroy us, uh, which is nice because you're like, oh, good, happy ending. And then there's the cut back to the church. <laughs> and if you think about it, the ghosts are now breaking their politeness rule because they didn't knock and they're there past 1 a.m. <laughs> oh, dear. It's worth it to, to get um, Father Malone. Yeah. So, the, oh. The speech or whatever that, um, what's the DJ's name? Stevie Wayne. Stevie gives at the end. That's what made me think maybe all of this, like, wasn't real or something. Because because of the fog, the whole movie has such a dreamy quality. And then that paired with the beginning quote, which was also something about a dream. Mm -hmm. Like, that's what made me think maybe it was some, like, mass hysteria event or something. Or maybe it was, like, a communal nightmare or something you know what i mean it just it threw me off a little bit but then the uh ending scene uh put it right back into perspective for me (laughs) (laughs) well it kind of makes it seem and now that we're at the end i'll go ahead so she says i don't know what happened to antonio bay tonight something came out of the fog and tried to destroy us in one moment it vanished but if this has been anything but a nightmare and if we don't wake up to find ourselves safe in our beds it could come again to the ships at sea, you can hear my voice. Look across the water into the darkness. Look for the fog. So it's like she's still giving that like open-ended warning of like things might not be over. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sorry. Uh, that that tripped me up, the syntax there. So if we don't wake up <laughs> safe, what is it? So, <laughs> And if we don't wake up to find ourselves safe in our beds, it could come again. So if this shit is real, it could come again. Did I write it down wrong? No, no, no. no you wrote it right. down correctly. It's a little bit of a tricky line. Yeah. If we... <laughs> I'm sorry. Usually I can do this. <laughs> and if we don't wake up to find ourselves safe in our, safe in our beds. Oh, so if we stay sleeping, right? Uh... If we wake up, but we're not... If we wake up and it's a night... If things are terrible, 
if it we could wake come up again and this shit is real yeah then it's it could happen we're not again. safe in our beds <laughs> <laughs> meaning we're dead <laughs> It's okay. a little murky. <laughs> oh, listen, I Again. will defer to the wiser minds. <laughs> it's not a cerebral movie. It's not making sense. Stevie sounds great saying those lines she on the radio. certainly <laughs> does. I feel soothed by listening to <laughs> Yeah. Dude, okay. I don't listen to radio. Is it always so sexy? Yes. Yeah? Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. People now call it podcast voice. It's, yeah. It, oh. Uh-huh. Well, dude, I'm not doing that on this podcast. Christopher no, did it for his nobody episode. Nobody should. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Christopher did it? Okay. Yeah. Christopher's the only sexy one of us. Yeah. I do not have a podcast voice. <laughs> this is real, and I can't talk slow. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I feel like with even if you think about like, you know, the radio host today, they're kind of a personification or a characterization of themselves mm-hmm. where they do a high pitched voice or a silly voice or a character. They do little things that they would not do in their normal voice or the normal like person. Gotcha. I've heard yeah. men and women do that on the and I hate listening to the radio because I hate the, the car chat. It's that broadcast oh. thing. They, it's the mid Atlantic voice because yeah, they want to make sure they, that they, they don't do that. sound like they're too much from one region or another uh. because it will test poorly with certain parts of the nation. Yeah, broadcasters so I think feel like we're all in, stupid. And with her too, like you could hear her going from a normal speaking voice, and then to like, "Hello, welcome back to KAB." Right. You know? Right. Yeah. We well, also just know she's a hot mom. Plus, <laughs> true. Yeah. Thanks, I, Al. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love the scene early on in the movie where she's doing her voice, and then she clicks off the air she's playing a song and she just sighs mm-hmm. yeah. it's like oh god Ugh. you know it's a long yeah. night she lights a cigarette she's <laughs> sitting yes <there. laughs> it's a long night at work predicting the fog that last like when he chops his head off coolest shot of the whole movie hell yeah I, I didn't expect it at all that mm-hmm. shit was so cool it's great I love the freeze frame ending it's, it's just I'm like yes and then the music I'm like yep horror movie yep yep so I don't remember at the beginning of the movie, but at the end, when the credits start rolling, did you notice the top three build people? They're all women. Mm-hmm. Oh. So uh, what other movie, horror or not, have you ever seen that in? Top three? Top three build people. Never. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah, extremely like, rarely. It's like ever, old, ever? Only ever Maybe John Carpenter, because <laughs> that's kind of his thing. <laughs> <laughs> Bridesmaids. <laughs> You're right. Uh, Classic yeah. horror. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, too, it's not, I mean, Janet Lee, but I mean, and this is only Jamie Lee Curtis' second movie. Right. She was on the love boat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> with, her, <laughs> with, her, with her mom. <laughs> right. Oh, man, those scenes were great. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. The love boat. Unbelievable. <laughs> All right, so I feel like we've discussed a lot of the fun, campy, amazing, weird, great, and not-so-great things about this movie. And I think we're ready to find out how scary it was to all of us on this here podcast called What Scares Us. Um, apparently, not a lot of things that we're watching lately. So the scarometer, I'll give a, a scarometer ranking, then I'll give an overall movie ranking. My scarometer ranking, I didn't think this movie was particularly scary. I think they did a lot of really nice elements that were supposed to be spooky and give you that like ominous sort of darkness. Um, but we basically, I said, hey, it can be PG. Um, so, scarometer, I don't know. I can't do it. Um, I'm, I'm, this, is, oh, this is on a five scale for the scarometer. I'll give it... I'll give it a one and a half. Wow. I'll give it a one and a half, maybe a two. Um, all right, stop. They're making eyes over there. So that's my scary meter ranking. And the movie, Ooh. I don't think it's a perfect film. I, I personally rank all movies on a five-point scale, and I give very few things a five. I give a lot of threes. Um, but this movie, if I have to rank it on a 10-point scale, which I think is one of the Biggest abominations, but <laughs> we need to get into why that is. It doesn't. It's, in, I, it's inconsistent. But we are going with the ten point ranking for the the movie, and I'll give it an eight out of ten. It's not a perfect film. There are very high class, very well made movies that I've given an eight to. 
um, because it's beautiful and perfect and so and so directed it. But this movie, I just, it's such a thrill to me. I just love it. It's got great acting, the directing, the scenes, the setting. It's just, it makes me so happy. And I like watching this movie a lot. Um, so I give it an eight out of 10. It's just, I don't know what it is about it. There's just something about this film that just completely, it's one of my, it's one of my favorite horror movies. There's just a lot to it that I, I just really, really enjoy. It's just a good movie. Um, Christopher, <laughs> were you scared? Did you like it? Oh, I did like it. And you stole my, you stole my two ratings for scare o -meter. So I was thinking either one and a half or <laughs> two stars on the scare meter So it's, uh, it's not super scary, but it's nicely creepy and it does have some gory scenes, although you don't see anything on screen. So, uh, there's a lot there. And as far as the movie itself, I give it a seven out of 10 stars. So, uh, really fun to go back to the eighties. And, uh, as I said, at the beginning of the show, it's kind of, you, you kind of see where it's from and where it's going. So it was great. Um, so I feel like I'm a little bit out here on an island, like uh, Stevie. I um, <laughs> lucky you. <laughs> so in terms of scare meter, uh, movies that I consider scary do exactly what this one did, where it has this consistent tone throughout it that is really tense and keeps you. That I don't necessarily need it to be viscerally scary the entire time for me to feel it. I the. First time I saw this movie, I, I admit I was a little bit bored, but I was comparing it to other John Carpenter movies. But as I've watched it more and more every year since I was 13 or whatever, I've grown to love it more and more and be more scared by it because it just works. Um, for Scare Meter, I would honestly give it a four out of five because it, oh. it keeps you in this tension. And a lot of that has to do with the music and then just the... the um, the physical locations. There's just something extra spooky about a coastal town. I can't explain why that is for me, but it is. Um, this is truly, I know I know this is probably weird to say, this is one of my most favorite movies. Um, kind of regardless of how people feel about it in terms of John Carpenter's filmography, it remains maybe my favorite of his. And part of that is it's nestled between like two of, two of his best movies. And it, has a lot of the good qualities of Halloween. It has a lot of the good qualities and from a filmmaking standpoint of something like escape from New York or the thing. Um, it's my, it's definitely my favorite music of his. The main theme is as best, his best work, I think. Um, and also it has, it's 90 minutes. That's the perfect length for a movie. No movie, especially a horror movie should be more than 90 minutes and no role in the movie. In my opinion is wasted. Almost everybody that shows up mm -hmm. serves a good purpose. Anybody that speaks, at least. Um, so I give it a 10 out of 10. I love this movie. And I only love it more every time I watch it. Mm -hmm. I will say that on my own personal list, this movie is, is a 5 out of 5. Yeah. I can't do a 10-point scale. I, just can, <laughs> I cannot. <laughs> well, I will I, not stop talking about that. So... Congratulations, Matt. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Here, I'll give your rating. I'll give your rating a ten out of ten. <laughs> yeah, I love this movie. Okay, here's my official review of this movie. Oh <laughs> snap! She's gonna <laughs> throw it down. <laughs> All right, this movie walked so that Pirates of the Caribbean could run. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, I had a hard time because I spent a lot of time comparing it to other things that I have seen. And, um, I was in, I think, sixth grade when the original Pirates of the Caribbean came out. And that movie did, it didn't scare me, but it's so creepy. Like, all of the, I don't know, dead pirates. Um, I'm also realizing as we have more episodes that I think I'm going to have to start trending downwards in terms of the scarometer because there are very few movies that honest to god freak me out mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um so i think that we'll see that trend as we you know create more episodes scarometer i'm giving this a one unfortunately um you're all so brave 
What? I said, you're all so brave. You're not scared of this movie at all. Aw. <laughs> but also, she's watching it for the first time after having lived a whole life of a lot scarier things. Oh, of course. Or, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. This like, is... I didn't watch this in the 80s. Like, I just right. watched this for the first time less than five years ago. Right. Um, so, it, it's, like you said, it's hard to have seen so many other things. Yeah. And I, I do feel like if I had seen this before Pirates of the Caribbean, I absolutely would have been more scared of it. Um, yeah. I'm... I'm trying so hard not to talk about Disney World right now. That's super <laughs> I just came over and we talked about Frozen for a good eight minutes. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think folks who have been listening closely to this podcast will not be surprised that I did not enjoy this movie very much. Um, I was really happy to watch it with you guys because you obviously love it. And I do feel like I got a lot more from it just from your enthusiasm but um this is just not the movie for me which is fine i am realizing as we make more episodes that i have a very like narrow niche of what i like in terms of horror um so yeah a one on the scarometer for me and then i'm going to give this movie a solid five overall because i think it's a really solid movie it just five doesn't out of appeal to me yes I'm one of the freaks that doesn't like this movie. I'm the only <laughs> outlier in this, and it's fine. Five out of ten. That's a failing grade. <laughs> you know what? In yeah. 1980, everybody gave it a two out of ten. So it also did make a me... failing grade. <laughs> <laughs> it made me feel a little better because, like, I know that you love this movie, um, and all of the response that I saw online when I was like looking for fun facts, and everyone loves this movie. But then I, I felt like maybe I was like some like outlier or like, you know what I mean? Like everyone yeah. loves this movie. It's not hitting for me. Why is this? I can't figure this out. But then I watched the special features and Jamie Lee Curtis was like, nope. And I was like, oh, nice. Okay. This I, is also like an accepted opinion. <laughs> the other thing, like, and not everybody loves this movie because if you look at, I was digging into the reviews of the 4K release versus the Blu-ray release, and there is one of the most scathing reviews of any movie I've ever seen oh, about really? this. Oh, yeah, from a guy that like is a, it's on some like Blu-ray reviews.com or something like that, and he is just like, I don't understand what anybody sees in this movie. It's terrible in comparison to everything that that horror is and anything John Carpenter's done. Like it's a dud. You can tell that it, it was sloppily made, and I totally see all those points. If I'm, but that's only if I'm looking for them, you know. Uh, so, but mm -hmm. no, this is it's. I think it's beloved in the way that maybe not exactly this way, but it's like a cult classic kind of yeah. thing. Oh, you absolutely. Know, people, people have come around to it. Ellison, you needed sad pirate ghosts. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> that is like a key component for me liking a horror movie, which has been like really weird to discover. I also <laughs> discovered in watching this that I don't think I really like John Carpenter movies. I love The Thing. I find Halloween boring, the original Halloween. And then I started watching, I watched maybe like the first 10 or 15 minutes of Prince of Darkness. And it was like so many of the things that I didn't quite understand about this movie, like why are the credits coming in 10 minutes after we already mm -hmm. you're, like the same thing was happening in Prince of Darkness. I yep. was like, Oh, this is just a stylistic thing that like doesn't work for me personally, mm -hmm. but I can recognize that it's like, I mean, it's a good movie. You know what I mean? It's not a bad movie. Um, I just couldn't turn my brain off. My little spreadsheet brain was um, <laughs> exploding the whole time. <laughs> so, don't give up on John Carpenter until you watch In the Mouth of Madness. Yeah, yeah. I need to see that. I want to see um, They Live really badly, too. Oh, and then I have uh, Escape from New York on my list, too. I don't really like action movies, though, so mm -hmm. I'm not sure. I, you know, I don't either, but it's still... But again, with some of these movies, like I enjoy like the cheesy 80s movies so much. Like Even if they're terrible, whether it's just like a regular poppy, romancy 80s story, they're all... There's so many terrible ones, but they're just like... They just hold up to me because that was just like, I was watching those when I was a kid. Like I was, mm -hmm. you know, eight, 10, 12 watching all of these things. Not this movie. I didn't watch it until a few years ago. But, and so for me, I just have like this complete soft spot for like terrible and amazing 80s movies. Um, and that's part of it for me is I, when I watch these things, even like, I'm not even a super fan of slashers, but watching some of the ones from the 80s is, it just, that's also oddly 80 slashes movies are the ones that turn me off from enjoying the horror genre. Um, that's a whole other thing. But it just, for me, I think it's a sense of nostalgia. Yeah. It's just like nostalgia and 
also I love the there's the scenery of the eighties and the soundtrack and the way they talked and the hair and the clothing and the, the way the the shot the things are set, the giant, you know, heavy cars and just made me, it makes me like even when I was watching this, I was like, Wow, I wanna wear that outfit. I wanna be walking down that street <laughs> and driving that car. Simpler times, simpler times. And drink beer while driving. Oh my, yeah. Well, not necessarily. <laughs> but I did enjoy not wearing a seatbelt as a child. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the other thing I want to tag on to the end here is like um, a, a lot of the appeal of this project to me is seeing movies that I wouldn't pick up on my mm-hmm. own and like having the chance to explore it with a group of people who have different interests and like different things appeal to them. So like don't let my rating of this influence anything moving forward because mm-hmm. I still want to like or mine for that matter. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know. I just, I wouldn't have picked this, and I'm super glad I watched it with you guys because I might not have finished it if it was just me. Like, mm-hmm. I stopped Prince of Darkness. I'll watch it again sometime, but... You don't need to. Yeah. Oh, really? It's not very good. I wanted to see it because um, I've been, like, so into Halloween stuff right now. I actually have Halloween um, Part 3 or whatever on hold for me because you said you love it, Amanda. Yeah. It's, oh, it's, that's <laughs> a fun one. It's, it's different. Well, we love it. You might hate it. Yeah, it, it it's... Uh, yeah. It's also Tom? not even a little bit related to Michael. There's no Michael Myers It's an anthology, connection. right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Which, which I think is so cool, and they could have done so... Anyway, yeah. But that was yeah. also what made me fall in love with Tom Atkins as an actor. Because yep. he's, he's like the main... He, he is. is he's so good in it. He's just... It's just, again, 80s-ish, yeah. so... Great music, too. I can't wait to hear your thoughts when you finish. The music is awesome. Like... Yeah. It's so good. <laughs> um, well, that's also, like, what I'm finding out with my crazy spreadsheet. Like, I'm 85 <laughs> movies. Like, I've watched 85 horror movies since December. Wow. Um, I don't like most of them. Like, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, just a lot of it, I've either seen it before or like it doesn't do anything new. So it, it really has to be something special to get my attention and make me think like, wow, I really want to see that again or I need to like dive deeper into that or something like that. Mm-hmm. I want to see that list. Well, too, I, Allison, I'll show you. <laughs> I feel like, and I think Allison, too, since you are like an avid horror fan and you've seen so many things, like even if you watch some John Carpenters and don't like them, I think it's still like a good thing to explore as a horror oh, fan yeah. is to understand like what his place, like what he's done. I think that's totally valid. And even if you don't like it, you you can still understand that. Okay, well, I get what people are talking about, but I don't get it. It's not for me. And you can, you know, watch like I would rather watch The Fog like five times and watch A Tale of Two Sisters once. <laughs> Dude, you know. that one just like destroys your brain. You yeah. have to be in a really particular mood to enjoy it, I think. Yeah. But there's just such a variety of things out there. Well, I think the other thing about watching John Carpenter's non horror movies is that if you're not, if you don't need to be scared because you're watching Escape from New York, you can just enjoy the wacky plot and the mm-hmm. fun and Ernest Borgnine. <laughs> Oh, the best awesome yep. role yep. and so it's like you if you if you're not going to be scared you just go into it mm-hmm. and it's so much fun it's a weird movie yeah. it's yeah. very weird it's not as weird as big trouble in little china which is maybe his most fun movie i think <laughs> it <laughs> is a lot of fun I, that movie is just terrific i love it yeah. can you imagine if that movie were made today it wouldn't be made it today would. you know that's that and that's i think that's part of why i love it is he has all these wacky ding-dong bullshit movies <laughs> that would that's, never that's have been quote. made. <laughs> John Carpenter and his yeah. wacky ding-dong movies. Dude, and I love them. It's t-shirt. It's the best. It's the best. Yeah. I just, and yeah. All right. So we have, we've been in the fog for a very long time. I think it's time we, <laughs> you know, uh, head to the lighthouse and put this to rest. Traverse um, the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't it be fun to go to that lighthouse all together? Oh, yeah. yeah. Field trip. <laughs> We're going to record our next podcast episode from uh, the lighthouse at Spivey Point after our episode in space. Well, that is our episode for today. If you like what you heard and want to reach out, you can email us at what scares us at aadl.org. Thank you so much for joining us. This has been What Scares Us. And until next time, look into the darkness across the water. Look for the fog.